Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 360 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Yeah. Today, recording day is Monday, April 15th, 2024, and it is going to be a nice day here at the Beaver Lodge. I'm your host, the Eager Beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, hey, and with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast's founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss V Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. And before we go any further, thank you for your patience, because we've got a bit of a late start today. And Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health doing today, sir? Well, sir, uh, when I wake up, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling the same way here. Sorry, kids, I had a bit of a itchy nose there. I couldn't <laughs> you're going to kiss a fool. I could not get out of bed this morning. For the life of me, I could not, I just couldn't get up. And the, the dog kept staring at me that she climbed onto the bed and hovering over me and trying to lick my face. I'm like, all right, fine. I'll take you out, take you out. So I took her out <clears throat> and it was a very short visit to the corner of the apartment building where she relieved herself quickly and then looked at me like, okay, I, I guess we're going back in. <laughs> it was really funny. She literally looked at me like, we're going in. We're going. I, I know you have to do some stuff. So somehow she seems to be able to tell the time. I don't. I don't understand dogs. I don't. I love them. I love her especially. Uh, but I just. I don't. I don't understand. <laughs> that's my. Uh, that's my. Uh, all right. All right. Ah, uh, kids and cubs. Uh, let's start with the fun stuff. Uh, another weekend, uh, another world championship. Oh. Yes. The Canadian national women's hockey team in an extremely thrilling, thrilling match defeated the United States of America in overtime to win the International Ice Hockey Federation Women World Championship. Yes. I, 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 I didn't get to see any of that, unfortunately. Oh, I watched the whole thing oh, yeah? from beginning to end. It must have been good hockey. Usually okay. is. It, great hockey. Okay, number one, Canadian women's national team. Seriously, do you need to give us heart attacks every damn time you play the United States in a final? Well, it's got to be exciting, right? I mean... I didn't see it, any of them. I didn't. I didn't even know the, the the tournament was on. I'm just. This whole weekend was literally work. The whole weekend, all I did was work. And and Bridget worked with me. Settle down. She's sitting here beside me, giving me this dirty look. Like what you what what you did that? No. The whole weekend we worked. So I didn't see any sports. I was supposed to go to a brunch yesterday to watch an Arsenal match. No, that didn't happen. 
It was right. a busy working weekend. So please regale me with the story of the okay. Canadian Women's National Hockey Team. Tournament took place in Utica, New York. Uh, in this particular match, the United States got off to a bit of a slow start, especially on shots on net. Canada scored first, and it didn't take long for the U.S. to respond. And in this match, it pretty much was like that. Somebody scored and somebody else would score within minutes oh. uh, later. Back and forth, call and response. No team led by more than one at any point at any point whatsoever. Uh, so uh, it was the second highest scoring Canada-US final in history. Really? 11 goals scored in all. Oh, so it's like a 6-5. Uh... It was 6-5 game, yeah. The highest one had been 7-5 in Malmo, uh, Sweden, back in 2015, I think. Uh, Julia Gosling... Uh, scored for Canada the second goal. She's a rookie on the team, and she just happens to be Ryan Gosling's cousin. Oh, how convenient. Yes, yes. And actually, Ryan Gosling has two cousins playing on the women's national team. Really? <laughs> Believe it or not. Yes, yes. And Ryan Gosling also did the opening, uh, was the guest at Saturday Night Live this weekend as well, So, and did a really great job. If you have not seen the Beavis and Butthead skit yet that's going around, it's freaking hilarious. <laughs> so just look at it if you, if you haven't seen it yet. It's absolutely great. Uh, then in the second period, Canada seemed to slow down a little bit, and uh, particularly on shots again, the United States uh, made up the gap. Um, I think it was Alex Carpenter from the United States who uh, then took the lead uh, in the goals, uh, gave the United States a 3-2 lead, and uh, her shot that, uh, that scored the goal was the shot that put the United States above Ca ahead of Canada in shots on net. So the second uh, period, period was much more uh, U.S. Um, Marie-Philippe Poulain, who is the captain of Team Canada and uh, often referred to as Captain Clutch because she has scored in four of the last five international finals uh, that Team Canada has played in and uh, including a hat trick, I believe, no, sorry, sorry, that was not her, sorry. Um, and uh, if you've been watching the tournament, you've seen the, the Gatorade commercial of the Canadian women's team in the, the locker room and someone giving a pep talk. That, that was Marie-Philippe Poulain giving the pep talk in that commercial. Uh, she got the first uh, shot on net of the match, but she hadn't scored all tournament long. Uh, really? Audibly. Yes. That's she really, scored, did what? Like she scored her? two in the final. It was the, Marie Philippe Poulain is like a goal scorer, like yep, nothing yep. in the tournament. She had not scored a goal in the tournament, scored two in the final, was player of the match. <laughs> oh, good for her. Shows up for the final. Uh, uh you know, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna count, that's the time to do yep. it. Right? But this was a combination of uh, rookies and veterans and everybody uh, adding to the scoring here. Uh Canada picked it back up in the third uh and uh opened up a five shot uh, uh five shots on goal lead on the United States about eight minutes in. So for some reason they took a walk a little bit in the second period, but came back. Um, then uh, after scoring her first goal, Marie-Philippe Poulet then managed to get herself a penalty, which allowed two-time world champion MVP Hillary Knight of the United States, who uh, really did a number saw on this last uh, two years ago in Brampton by scoring a hat-trick in the final the United States won 6-3 in a match that had a lot of questionable ref calls. Um, yep, she scored her 65th goal at Worlds in her career uh, to bring it back to a tie. She uh, basically threw, it was a really weird goal. There was a shot that went off the boards. The boards were extremely lively. It came right back to her and then went right to the net. Um, so so see, when that happens as a goaltender, I can tell you, we hate it. Yep. <laughs> And then it's so frustrating. Yep. And then less than two minutes later, this uh, Canadian uh, player, I think Clark it was, also uh, made a shot from uh, to the side, but a little bit behind the net mm -hmm. uh, into some traffic in front of it. And it bounced off an American skate and into the net. So we got two weird, <laughs> we got one off the boards onto someone sticking into the net, and then one, uh, one sort of like dump puck dumped into the middle of the net, the, right in front of the net that went off a skate and went right into it yeah. within two and a half minutes of each other. So tied up again. Uh, then 
uh, Subwood, uh, then Poulain came back again to score uh, what was looked like was going to be the game-winning goal. But an American player named Harvey, who also scored in last year's final, tied it up with five minutes left. Uh, Canada started to play sloppy in the last couple of minutes, almost looked like they were trying to give it to the United States, just being completely unable to clear the zone for some reason. And uh, every time they were trying to clear, just directly putting the puck on United States sticks, it's like, please stop doing that. <laughs> but uh, time ran out and it went to overtime, during which Poulet missed on a breakaway. <laughs> then Canada missed on an incredible two on one uh but that ended up drawing a too many uh they always say too many men on the ice yeah, <laughs> for yeah, some reason too many, the <laughs> women. too many players on the so, ice so are, are they are they trans i'm just i uh, i'm just trying I, to uh, i'm just turn the pot stirring the pot this morning yeah. uh and i don't know if it's the same for nhl because i haven't watched it overtime in a while but in international hockey they go down to four on four for overtime yes. yeah. so uh, when the penalty came it was four on three and with two seconds left in the power play and team canada's power play wasn't the best all tournament long um they brought it home a lady uh named and i am gonna screw the last name i am sure oh, don't, do that. don't do that don't that's that's rude sir Dac sir Dacny, danielle sir Dacny, number 92 uh, scored with two minutes left. So uh, Ambrose from Canada sh shot, and then it, there was a rebound, and uh, she got it and uh, dumped it in the net. Who, who, uh, who placed third? Finland placed Ooh, third, yeah. beating Czechia uh, in also a match that went to overtime, and then a shootout oh. uh, for Finland's uh, first medal in three years at the World Championships. So I'm going to have to try and find the replay of that match because it sounds like it was a hell of a game to watch. Fantastic, yeah. high you know, energy, this is the fast thing. play, women's good hockey checks. is always thrilling to watch, especially on the international level. Team Canada, Team USA in the final, which is you know pretty much what always happens the but greatest rivalry in sport it, it really is but you 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 have noticed and i'm sure most of the viewers and listeners have noticed too that uh the nordic countries are really coming up fast like they're 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 just one level yep. below like literally just one level below and there's other nations in the world that are like we're gonna we're gonna take this crap on mm -hmm. and they're doing it and i mean look canada usa in the final is a glorious thing to watch and i love it but I do want to see other countries that that are capable to get there and play for the final as well. It, look, I want Canada to win the gold medal every single time, period. The World Cup every single time, no question. But if another country, two other countries came in and won it, I wouldn't be upset. You know, if it was like, say, Finland and uh, Norway or Finland and Sweden or Sweden and, I don't know, Germany. I would not be upset by that because it advances the sport for everybody involved. And with mm -hmm. the PWHL, the Professional Women's Hockey League, they are recruiting players from other parts of the world. I mean, 99% of the league is made up of Canadian women. Well, I shouldn't say 99%. There's a lot of American women that play in that league as well. Yeah, yeah there A are. lot of American women. There's only six teams. It's, it's, you know, the nascent days. It's starting out and it will get bigger and better as time goes on. And every match I've watched has been thrilling somebody said something to me the other day an older gentleman a staunch conservative said i like it i've enjoyed it i've watched a few matches and they've been really thrilling he says but if it's going to survive women need to come out and support this on mass and i'm like yeah you're right he says not only that he says not only that paul but also women with money need to come out and support this he goes you've got like the the wnba and and people are saying well they need to be paid the same as men it's like well no that's ridiculous they don't draw the same uh crowd they, they don't more. get this no they don't well i don't know about the WNBA, but the ncaa they did no oh, yes the ncaa tournament yes but wnba they don't get the same crowds they don't have the television contract they just the audience isn't there and it's like well women yes. you got to get up get up off your ass and support this and i'm talking about women like oh oprah winfrey a billionaire put your money where your mouth is get out there and support it put some money into it you're always talking about propping people up and lifting people up then get out there and do it god damn it do something about it don't tell me how much you support women and then rely on the rest of us to do it do the work for you 
Am I calling her out a little bit? Yeah, I kind of am. I kind of am. Okay. But that's okay. I'm allowed to do that. It's a free country where I'm allowed to freely express myself and I'm freely expressing myself. Mm -hmm. She needs and to get up off her duff and support it. Yep. Put and her when money where her mouth is. Yep. When you're talking about other teams, uh, there was another tournament going on uh, parallel to this also in Utica with the lower ranked teams in the lower division because, you know, you play your way up into like divisions as you win. And uh, so uh, playing also this weekend, but didn't get on TV, were teams from Kazakhstan, Spain, Mexico, Chinese Taipei, Iceland, and Belgium. Oh, well. Wow. There you go. Uh, so yeah, it was a great tournament. The final, uh, did sell out, of course, uh, yes. Canada, Canada's goaltender was René Debien. Uh, the shots ended 24 for the United States, 30 for Canada. And it was an interesting uh, match because it was, uh, new, uh, uh, youth versus veterans. The average age on the United States, uh, national team was 21. The average age on the Canadian one was 28. Oh, wow. That is a, that's, that's a big difference. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a youth big difference. Versus veterans, right? Yeah. Yep. And uh, the veterans this time uh, were able to do it. Uh, they uh, avenged the loss in Brampton from uh, two years ago, uh, yes. winning on U.S. home soil. And uh, the rivalry continues. Uh, now the players go back uh, to their uh, regular league teams uh, where they are getting ready for the playoffs. And I know that a couple of weeks ago, uh, I think there was a, a match, uh, or there were matches now uh, in much bigger stadiums, like they had. Uh, I think they had one at Scotiabank Place in in Ottawa, uh, not too long ago, and uh, the entire place sold out. And then a couple of weeks after that, I think there was one in Montreal, and that entire place sold out. So uh, the Canadian mm. women's, well, the Canadian, sorry, not the Canadian women's, the professional women's hockey league, uh, keeps on selling out bigger and bigger venues. So. Uh, that's really, really good for them. And well, I really do hope it continues because it's an exceptional product. It really is. And they've sold out the uh, 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 Centre Bell in, in Montreal every time they've played there. They don't play there regularly because they have yes. a separate stadium. But when they have played there, it's been a sellout each time for a number of reasons. A, that the, the tickets are, you know, affordable to begin with. So, yes. Right? Yes. But the product on the ice is damn good. I've watched a bunch of PWHA games and all of them have been good. All of them. There was one I watched where they, you could start when they, I think it was the first or second match and they were sort of trying to get their legs and feel each mm -hmm. other out. And so there was a lot of back and forth, but they're evenly matched for the most part. I've not seen a lopsided victory. I'm sure mm -hmm. there has been one, but I've not seen one and it's, it's good hockey. It's damn good hockey. And people are supporting it. So that's great. And you got to remember too, especially with, with the, the millennials and well, not Gen Z to, to the same degree, but millennials have a lot of young children. A lot of those young children are very often little girls. Guess what little girls want to see? Bigger girls succeeding or women, of course, but you, you get what, you get the yep. vibe I'm trying to lay yeah, out. No, there was a commercial actually when we were playing it. It was like, a, you know, a father and very, very young daughter. She couldn't have been more than five mm -hmm. watching TV together. And she looks at her and she goes, where are the girls? Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and this is the other thing too. It's it's like the, the younger generation is much more involved in the lives of their children than the older generation was. You know, that like you see millennial parents and, and to a, 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 a degree as well. Uh, Gen X parents who are much more involved than say their boomer parents were with, with us. And I'm not knocking our parents. Mm -hmm. for that. I'm not, it was just a different world, a different time, but fathers are getting involved in their young daughter's lives and like, daddy, let's have a tea party. Okay. Daddy, I want to paint your nails. Okay. No objections. Like literally. And, and you see some of these big burly bear looking guys and, and sitting there in a, in a tutu while his daughter paints his nails and he's like, because I love the things we do for our kids. I'm getting emotional about this. I don't have children. I'm getting emotional. It's like, cause these father, fathers love their children. So PWHA will, will dub PWHL will succeed because you have a generation well, who want it to, cause they yep. want their daughters, their little girls, their teenage girls to see role models succeeding in a sport that they were not necessarily you know during their day 
uh, girls and women didn't have a place and mm -hmm. now they do. Yep. So. We're also seeing it with NFL football. Not that there's a women's league, but the, no. you know, men and daughter, their daughters are watching together now because well, Taylor Swift and Taylor Swift brought millions, millions upon millions of young girls to the game to see it. But there, there, there are moments now. There are actually natural moments coming on for like other moments for daughters and yes. fathers to connect that weren't there before, which mm. is a very, 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 very again. Multiply the opportunities for people to connect. Yeah. Well, what was it, uh, uh, Nelson Mandela? Wow, I'm emotional this morning. Nelson Mandela, who talked about how you know sport can unite. Sport can unite. Mm -hmm. It was when he, he took the team captain of the, the Springboks and said, I yeah, want the, the rugby team. Yes. The, the rugby team. He says, I want you to win the rugby world cup. And the, and the team captain who was, he, he, he wasn't a racist or he wasn't a apartheid supporter, thankfully, but, but I mean, this was a, a, a privileged white male who grew up in privilege, who after meeting Nelson Mandela said, he's remarkable. I've never met a person like that before. I've never, you know, and he says he wants us to win the World Cup, so we're going to damn well do it. And they did against the uh, the All Blacks, the New yep. Zealand All Blacks. New Zealand All Blacks. And, and Jonah Lomo, who was by far the greatest rugby player to ever play the sport. And if you don't know who he is, look him up. And and when he was in the like when they made the movie, the the, the film, Invictus with uh, Invictus. Morgan Freeman and uh, Matt Damon. <laughs> when they made that film, they actually slowed down the footage of Jonah Lomo mm -hmm. playing in the tournament when they showed him because they're like, nobody would believe anybody was that big. It was that fast. So they're like to sell it to the rest of the world. Are there those who don't, you know, American audience, of course, because we're an American film to sell it to people who don't know rugby or don't know who Jonah Lomo is. We have to slow it down. Mm -hmm. It's remarkable when you can see it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're, you're, you're manipulating the story to make it look slower. It's like, yeah, because they had to, because nobody would believe, Somebody who was like six five, three hundred pounds could run and move that fast. But the way they talked about it, and, and my friend, by the way, was at that tournament. My friend attended the tournament mm -hmm. in South Africa. He was there when the plane flew over and it said go Springboks. Mm -hmm. He was there for that. And he said, You would not believe how fast that man could move. Wow. We have lots of comments from the kits here. Uh, Kit, Linda, uh, a lot of that is thanks to Billie Jean King doing for the PWHL what she's done for tennis. Yes, yes. and that's been one of the things uh, about the league that is uh, very good. Kit Tavi G, the only time my dad came out to watch me, he ended up taking me to the hospital for a broken nose. Oh, I'm so sorry. <sighs> Kit Toronto Dan, me and my first daughter bonded through Stone Cold Steve Austin and Spice Girls. There you go. Hey, any combination works. Kit exactly. Michael, it will succeed, talking about the PWHL, because they took the time to do it right this time too. Pave the way to a bright future and demanding equality. Exactly. Yes. With uh, the negotiation and the players' contracts and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and everybody is in on it. Everybody uh, you know, wants this to succeed and is rowing in the same direction, uh, which is uh, absolutely just fantastic. And then Kit Linda M again, it's great seeing all the young girls in the stands at the PWHL games. It's also great seeing men with their faces painted being fans. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Hey, good hockey is good hockey. Yeah. Period. doesn't matter who's playing. Yeah, no, that's, that's what true. I will say. I think this and a good game is a good game, and we got treated to a good game. And this final also avenged uh, the loss in regular round play, where Canada had lost in a one-zero match that went into overtime in a regular round play uh, to the United States. So all in all, a great, 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 great tournament. I absolutely have to say, congratulations, Teams Canada! Congratulations, women! Uh, you did us proud again. You always do regardless of the result. Um, mm. But um, yeah, this one was very satisfying. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, to, yeah. I, 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 I will say. watch the entire match. on That was replay. when literally don't fast forward over a bit, even okay. the few sloppy yes. bits that happen. And you'll see, you'll, you will. The reason why I mentioned the sloppy bits, the two sloppy bits uh, in the, in the game is because it's so obvious. It's almost like, you know, sometimes when people panic and they're really trying to clear the zone, it's like, just get a stick on it and dump it. It's like, yeah, but you've got to look where you're dumping it first so that yeah. you don't dump it along the boards right on somebody's stick. <laughs> where the puck is going to be, right? Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, and then some fanning on a couple of shots and stuff. It's like, just 
get it out of the damn zone. The number of times I yelled yesterday, just clear the damn zone <laughs> to the TV. <laughs> <laughs> like I had played hockey all my life and had coached uh, it. <laughs> just clear the damn zone. <laughs> I, I find and my beaver sweetie it. was laughing at me because he's not really a hockey fan, but he's a soccer fan. So when he yeah. heard me just clear the damn zone, he knew it. this is yeah. exactly what I meant. <laughs> well, and, and what starts this week? What starts this week? NHL playoffs. Woo-hoo. Ottawa's not in it. Montreal's not in it. Yes. So who am I? To, yesterday I'm talking with Bridget and she goes, who are you cheering for? And I go, uh, well, if Ottawa's not in it, any team that plays Toronto, that's who I'm cheering for. Oh, that's <laughs> Look, not nice. It, well, it's, it's it, my two favorite teams are the Ottawa Senators and whoever's playing Toronto. Now, for my <laughs> Toronto peeps in the chat and on the video, Look, the rivalry's fun for me. I grew up a Leafs fan. I did. I grew up a Leafs fan. I did. It's no word of lie. I had Leafs sweaters, and I used to get picked on by my friends who loved the Habs. But I grew up a Leafs fan because, you know, I did, like, one of, uh, a guy I played hockey with when I was a kid, his uncle was George Ferguson. Hmm. You may or may not remember that name, but he played for the Leafs back in the 70s. So, you know, that, there, there was an instant connection there, an instant bond. Of course, living in Ottawa for the better part of my life, I moved here in 1980, left in 84, came back in 87. Most of my life has been spent in this city. When we got a team, I was cheering for both Ottawa and Toronto the for the first couple of seasons. And then it was one season, I think it was when Jacques Martin became the coach. Okay. I made the flip. I made the flip that year. And I had a lot of friends who are our Leafs fans who said, I remember when Jacques Martin first started coaching for for Senators. And um, there was a game they played against Toronto, and they beat Toronto soundly. But it was it was tight. It was like a, a five four match or six six five or whatever it was. And I remember watching the game, and a buddy of mine on Monday morning, uh, when I saw him at work, he was like, "Dude, that was a great game." And he says, "And and that coach Jacques Martin is going to take that team places." He goes, "That's hockey." He goes, I, "I'm not going to switch because I'm a dyed in the wool Leafs fan, but." that could make me cheer for them when they're not playing Toronto. And I went, wow, that's, that's huge from you. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy is, he's got the Maple Leaf tattooed on his, like the Toronto Maple Leafs. It's uh, leaves is the plural of leaf, by the way. Yes. Yes. (laughs) And and you know that uh, the, the leaf is an acronym. You know that, right? Okay. Leafs, Toronto Maple yes. Leafs. Leafs is an acronym. Losers okay. even after oh. 50 seasons. Jeez. Oh, ouch. Come on. It's good. Right? Ouch. It's ouch. good. It's good. <laughs> okay. I'm a little more generous, Kits and Cubs. I cheer for Ottawa first, although I am a dilated, died in the wool, also Habs fan, because that's what I grew yeah. up as uh, as a kid. But uh, Ottawa boy, Habs, uh, then every other Canadian team then the Leafs, then every other team. <laughs> so, so. And, and then if it's just American teams, whoever is the biggest underdog, I cheer for. So, so here's the funny thing. So, Well, actually, sorry, sorry. Cities in the United States actually do get snow, then cities that don't yeah, yeah, get yeah, snow. Yeah. So, so like if Minnesota, if, the, if, the, if Minnesota was in the playoffs, if they were in the final, I would cheer them right to the end. Because Honorary Canadian. They really are. They really are. That yep. team... And since if it's Minnesota team, against Florida, it's definitely Minnesota. <laughs> well, since they got a team back, because they had the Minnesota North Stars, which yes. went to Dallas. But since they got a team back, every single home game has been 100% completely sold out. I think but, something like 75 or 80% of the tickets are season tickets. They have yeah. the largest fan base in that rink in the league. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I kid you not, Toronto, yeah. Montreal, wish... They had now Toronto makes more money. Toronto is the biggest draw. It's the biggest money maker in the league after the New York Rangers because the New York Rangers are, are, are a thing under themselves. I mean, New York sports fans are forget it, forget it, right? Yeah. So it's it's the Rangers, the Leafs, and then everybody else, and those two teams basically generate all the income. Mm-hmm. But Minnesota could almost, you know, stand on their own when it comes to income generation because oh, yeah. they they. Come on, the whole state is like, yep. if you don't and, play hockey, you don't live. Right. And when I say Minnesota's honorary Canada, I really mean it because the two national curling teams in the United States both come from Minnesota as yeah. well. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Like, and I think they have more advanced health care in the state as well. Yeah, they, yes, they do. Given, yeah. So it's like, just join, man. Just yeah. join. Just, just, <laughs> just We're waiting for you. Minnesota, Minnesota. 
Yeah. Minnesota, I guess, eh? <laughs> I guess if ever you find your man's not treating you right, come well, up and call me on my cell phone. Whenever you will need my love, call me on my cell phone. Come into my e glue. Okay. <laughs> so, so Dan is saying, Toronto, Dan, if the Leafs make the second round, Paul wears full Leafs gear on the show. If Ooh. they don't, I'll burn my Matthews jersey live in my dad's fire pit. Do not burn your Matthews jersey don't alive. Do Dan. He's having Dan, an amazing season. Do don't not do that. do that. Don't do that. Number one, don't do that. Please 60 don't do goals, that. king of the hat yeah. trick. No, yeah. do not do that. Don't do that. And, and where's, <laughs> he from? where's he from? Nevada. He's, he's from like Vegas. Come on. Don't do that. Don't Number do that. one, don't do that. Number don't two. That's never going to happen. <laughs> oh, I'm not. No, it's not oh, happening. Oh, oh, it, 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 but it, it's it's funny though. It's like if they make the second round. <laughs> oh, <it's> so not <laughs> nice. Oh, see, no, but Dan's Dan's a realist. Dan's a realist. He gets it. Like, let's play like, how I could blow game seven today. <laughs> Arizona. Sorry, sorry. He's from Arizona. Even even more southern. He's from Arizona, not not Nevada. My apologies. My apologies. Oh, man. Oh, geez. but but it, it's 70 goals. He's not, he doesn't have 70 goals, but he could He's got 70 now. Does he? No, 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 no. I, know I he think he was on 60. track for 65. And the last game of the season was this weekend for almost every team. Ottawa's last home game was Saturday night against uh, Montreal. And I don't yeah. even know what the final outcome was, to be honest. Yeah, there's still, uh, there are, there are a few ma matches left. He has uh, 69 goals. Season. Is he yeah, at 69? Yeah, yeah, not a lot, not a lot of games left. Sixty nine goals. When yeah, was the last time goals. Anybody, when was the last time anybody in the league scored that many goals? I, mean, I have no idea. It's been a long time. You do remember the season when I think um, uh, Ottawa native, well, Nepean native, technically. Um, uh, I see his face. Can't think of his name right now. Nepean native uh, played for Detroit. He was the captain of the Eiserman? Red Wings. Thank you, Steve Eiserman. I, I was okay. drawing a blank. Uh, like probably the most handsome man that had played the game at that time. Mm. I think he scored like 80 goals one season. Oh yeah. Um, and there was like five or six players that scored 70 plus that season. Mm -hmm. And then he, he got his knee blew his knee out. And I thought his career was over and he came back and won three Stanley cups or something. Like that. Yeah. Crosby was the last to score that many goals. And how many years ago was that? Yeah, that was the nineties. Oh, thank you, darling. My, my lovely, my lovely. Okay, see, so he's here. Uh, Matthews, 26, can become the ninth player in NHL history to record 70 goals in a single season if he manages it. So, nine. And the last one that scored 70 goals in a season was Brett Hall in 91 oh, wow. 92. That's so, over 30 years ago. Wow. Yes. Oh, wow. so, oh, Michael Lemieux says that it was Lemieux in 90, 95, 96. Okay, I uh, I have Brett Hall in ninety one ninety two, but you you could be right as well. Like because I'm just like looking really quickly off uh, off the internet. That goes, but uh, Timu Solani also uh, reached that goal. Alexander Mogilny reached that level once. Um, it's a long time ago though. Like we we haven't. Yeah, seen Mogilny. Any... I think he he Mogilny and Solani got seventy six goals mm -hmm. in those years. So again, still, it's a long time since anybody scored that many goals. Yeah. And uh, Gretzky has four of the four. Oh, see, this one says 14 70 goal seasons in, in league history. Yeah, yeah, through nine players, Gretzky will make four of them. Brett well, Hall having three and Marie Lemieux doing so twice. So Gretzky's the only man to score 200 points multiple times. I think he did it three times, 200 mm -hmm. or more points. But there's no record for that. They're like the, the man with the most 200 point seasons. Well, he's the only one who has ever done it and he did it three times. And they don't even count that as a record. Which is weird. Nobody's ever done it. <laughs> Nobody's even come close to doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just, uh, yeah, interesting. Uh, oh, by the way, and for Austin Matthews, so those who don't know, even though, uh, you know, he might be from, uh, where did you say? Not Nevada, He's from but Arizona. Arizona. from Arizona. He was actually born in, born in California. So he's yeah. a native Kucherov. Californian. Kucherov from Tampa Bay is 145 points. That, that's crazy. 
Yeah. So uh, good hockey all, all along. And as a kid, Vim also points out uh, in Canada, uh, the junior leagues are also in their playoffs. So the OHL, the WHL, the QMHJL, and uh, the LNAH, which not very many people talk about, but I think it's the Ligue, de Na- Ligue Nationale de, uh, de Hockey Amateur, I think, or Amateur League, Hockey League. Uh, but all of them are in the playoff mode right now, so there's plenty of good hockey for you to support uh, in addition to the NHL playoffs, uh, especially here in Canada. So please go check out your local teams uh, if yes. you can. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's they deserve hockey. your support, and it's a great night out. Yeah. It's a, it's a great night out. Can, all right. Can we, can we uh, get political for just a moment? I, I, of course, yeah. I was absolutely going to segue away from hockey show. to other stuff. <laughs> We've been hey, talking about hockey. Canadian for, politics and culture. Yes, this, the, and we are a general culture show. I have a video here from 1984. It's two minutes and 49 seconds. I know you will enjoy this, sir. I know it's not a, it's not a surprise or anything like this. I know you will enjoy this video. And I think the kits will too, because it will bring some uh, levity and brevity, not brevity, just levity to what we currently have in the House of Commons. So, Let's let's watch this. I I know you'll enjoy this. I, I really do. It's it's not a big surprise, but this is from 1984, and this is how things used to be. And we can get there again if we eliminate toxicity. Good evening. The longest running parliament in Canadian history is back in business, and the Liberal government is facing a new opposition leader. Brian Mulroney, the new Tory chief, made his first appearance as an MP. And it turned out to be quite a show. Jason Moskovitz reports. Well, I'm certainly. Uh, Brian Mulrooney on his way to the House of Commons for the first time. It's a day for the history books, and everyone knows it. There are people lined up to get into the House. There are greetings and good wishes from one and all as he winds his way down the staircase. The cameras are everywhere, and from the moment he sets foot in the House, the action begins. The standing ovation from all sides of the house is loud and long. The speaker welcomes him with the same degree of enthusiasm that seems to be bouncing around the room. When it's the Prime Minister's turn to welcome Mulroney, it's not the usual political welcome of hollow niceties. No, it sounds as if an old friend is roasting another. The member from uh, Central Nova has come a long way from that log cabin in Pictou County. (laughs) (laughs) I see he has uh, put away his uh, rumpled trousers and odd sweaters uh, (laughs) to be brought out again at the next election. But this uh, speaker has been occasion, an occasion to talk about the man rather than about the policies, so you will understand that I have gone on a little longer than otherwise would have been possible. <laughs> <laughs> Mulrooney's not at all prepared for a roast, but he's not prepared to shy away either. Off the cuff, Mulrooney hits back smoothly and confidently. The Liberal candidate in Central Nova persistently referred to a candidate from Quebec who didn't live in his riding and lived in a million dollar house rent free and I defended you sir regularly. <laughs> the Prime Minister announced that he's not a quitter. I want you to know sir that we're behind you all the way. The long awaited serious confrontation between Mulrooney and the Prime Minister will have to wait for another day. Today's roasting is history. Although certainly not everything said today is destined for the history books. Jason Moskovitz, CBC News, Ottawa. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I thought I thought you would. I really, I thought, you know what? You'll 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 like this because it <sighs> it, it harkens back to a time when civility and decorum were respect for institutions. All of it, right? Uh, Remember when conservatives used to be the party that respected institutions that stood for institutions? Yes. Yes. Period. That was their brand. Yeah. Now they just move fast and break things. Yeah. 
and 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 don't solve anything in the process, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, move, move fast and break things is fine when it's a pandemic and you're trying to fix the planet and save people. But move fast and break things when you're trying to run a country and you're not doing anything constructive. Yeah, that's nah. I, I thought you'd really enjoy that on a I really, really, really did. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, Every Kit Vim goes, we're gonna have another referendum in Quebec. Oh god. Really? Yes, but not not yeah, not on uh, not on separation uh, or sovereignty association thing. Um, but yes, uh, we, we all know that Lego is um, um, tanking in the polls. Oh, yes. Yeah, terrible. And um, like really, really bad. Uh, we, we talked about this on the show already, uh, how he uh, uh, took a quick dip somewhere uh, after uh, the election, uh, so much so that he, uh, flip flopped again on third link, uh, which is, a uh, you know, a construction project to build another, uh, way on to, uh, Quebec city from, uh, uh, the South shore. Uh, he keeps on, he will do it and then he won't do it and then he will do it and then he won't do it. And then it's for all cars and then it's not, and then it's for just for public transit and then it's not, uh, but They've been going back and forth like that, uh, but so much so that he even like flip flopped on that, uh, uh, and uh, he is uh, suffering. He uh, the party dropped from uh, being in the between thirty five and forty percent in the polls uh, back in September to twenty three percent just this last weekend, whereas the Parti Québécois is now at thirty three percent. So they got a ten point lead, which is the largest lead that they've had yet on the Parti Québécois. Uh, based on a polling that came out from 338 just last mm. week. So uh, when you're desperate and you're tanking, uh, you try to throw some red meat to the base. And since uh, François Legault has been on a big uh, ethno-cultural thing since he's become premier, uh, he decided that he wants to have a referendum on immigration because Quebec's thing has been wanting to have full control of their immigration policy uh, because you know language and that type of stuff and the federal government does give them more control over immigration a lot more say but doesn't give them full control and uh it seems that lego really wants it even uh, robert libman and if you're, you're a certain age you uh, know that name because he started parti uh parti égalité party equality in the quebec uh i think that's a uh, uh, three years ago now not sure. Uh, I don't. I don't recall. Yeah, you I'm know, it's, sure. I'm, I'm old. But he is. He, a lot of stuff. he, he was um, uh, a big Anglophone rights person. Uh, it promoted the the Parti Égalité was a party that promoted the use of English in Quebec on an equal basis uh, with French. It was founded in 1989, and I'm not sure. Well. The party had no success in subsequent elections and stopped organizing after the 2003 election. So, yeah, 89 to 2003. Uh, but he's still around. And he, he wrote this uh, column for uh, the Montreal Gazette stating that referendum was playing, uh, that Lego is playing with fire. Mm, indeed he is. On this referendum. Uh, because he had hinted to the National Assembly about the possibility of a referendum on immigration to force Ottawa's hand if by June 30th he doesn't get what he wants from Prime Minister Trudeau, Justin Trudeau on the influx of temporary immigrants to Quebec, which has been a big uh, thing that uh, Legault has been uh, uh, campaigning on. Uh, Legault rhetorically asked if a referendum was necessary to convince Trudeau that most, quote, Quebecers are saying it doesn't make sense to allow 560,000 immigrants to come into Quebec. Will we hold a referendum on getting full power over immigration eventually? Will we do it more broadly on other subjects? Legault asked. Um, also have to understand that uh, referendums are non-binding. That's correct. And um, just because people of Quebec would vote if they did vote, for Quebec to have all its uh, immigration powers mm -hmm. does not obligate in Ottawa in any way to actually say, oh, well, you voted, so I'm going to have to cede it now. Um, surrender it. it. It just doesn't happen that way. So uh, as the Libman say, says, it may be just bluster in politics, bar barring his nationalist teeth in a duel with Ottawa as a hedge against the resurgent separatist Parti Québécois. But if in desperation Legault goes down that path, much like Cameron went down Brexit, for example, as an act of desperation, and that blew up in his face. Yeah. Uh, 
Imagine the nightmare of a referendum on immigration, regardless of the question, would be easily morph into an ugly and divisive debate and almost certainly spiral into international headlines associating Quebec with anti-immigrant sentiment and xenophobia. Not that that's not happening already. So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think that this would be very good for uh, the Quebec economy and it would not help at all. At all, at all, at all, go in a, in any real way, uh, but it would definitely uh, mobilize sentiment. That's for sure. If you wanted to stir a pot and hoping that people getting people mad would make people come to the polls for him, uh, this would be one way to achieve that. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I would assume. Uh, that this is bluster, but who knows? Because uh, Lego was also, uh, if uh, one remembers, I think it was last December or January, uh, all over the microphone saying that the federal government really needs to come come, uh, come forward with its money on housing, like now, 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 now. Because we're also really going to force it like about two weeks or about a week before the federal government actually did do it. One of those things, you know, uh, taking something you know is going to happen anyway within a week or two and then going to the mic and making sure, making it like you're pressuring the government to do what it is they've already told you they're going to do anyway so that you look like you had a hand in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Game that people play. Uh, so uh, Lego uh, did do that. Um, over the course of the weekend, interestingly enough, the Parti Québécois had their National Congress in Drummond. Oh. So Paul Saint-Pierre Plamondon, there's a mouthful. <laughs> who is the leader of the party, mm. uh, proposed uh, proposed measures uh, temp himself to temporarily place a ceiling on temporary student and worker uh, immigration. Uh, they said that they had 175,000 uh, of those in 2023 to deal with the housing crisis, which is kind of an interesting policy because that's exactly what the federal government is doing as well. How convenient. Yeah. The immigration minister, Mark Miller, announced that there was going to be a cap on uh, foreign students first, which made all the premiers scream because they've been exploiting them to fund post-secondary education because they have not been funding it properly through general revenues. And now that a cap's been announced, they're scrambling because they don't know how they're going to fund it. They're going to actually have to use their own money and make choices. Um, um, so, unless they want the universities to all close down. So... Um, uh, yeah, uh, the CAQ pushed uh, pushed the the. Uh, see, this is really funny that the CAQ is demanding or musing about a referendum. But then when the C when the Parti Québécois says, "Well, maybe we should put a cap on the number of uh, students that we have that are coming for temporary students and the number of people that we're coming have as temporary foreign workers," well, then the CAQ pushes this aside. No, no, that's not a workable solution. We need a referendum. Uh -huh. uh, actually, the more workable solution is to collaborate with the federal government on the measures that they're already doing, which the federal government has announced a cap on students and has announced that they will be capping on federal, for, uh, actually has announced that they will cap federal foreign workers, trying to reduce that uh, by one third within two years of the numbers that it is now. And uh, there's a lot of complaining about uh, immigration levels, but uh, let us all remember again, and I know I say it all the time. I got in this conversation with someone over the weekend says, you know, why are you always harping on the premiers? And it's like this because well, there was a time emerging from COVID where there was a lot of federal program problems, passports yeah. and airports immediately come to mind, but the passports and the airports and all those types of things seem to have resolved themselves, but health, roads, education, uh, climate, uh, all of these things are provincial and they're not getting better. They're getting worse. Housing, homelessness, addiction. Um, and uh, the provinces have made it very clear that they have absolutely no intention of doing anything or spending any money. They keep on running to Ottawa and say, Daddy, can you take care of this? And then when Trudeau does, then they turn around, they go, not like that, like Alberta's doing right now on housing, trying yeah, to pass exactly. a lot and make it so, you know, it's like, you know, you go through me. It's like, why would I go through you when I do go through you and you don't spend the money or you don't refuse to take the money or you fight me for six months on taking the money. <laughs> it's like, well, I mean, it's, it's like, like I, 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 as the federal government, my, my objective is to get this stuff built. If it's not going to be, if you're not going to do it, then I'm going to find myself a partner who can. Well, that's right. like I, I wrote in the descriptor about how, uh, literally they, 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 um, uh, transfer payments from the federal government for healthcare to the provinces have quadrupled since 2000 
yes. they've not spent all the money on healthcare. No. There's seventy billion dollars unaccounted for in healthcare spending. Exactly. And I'm sorry, as premiers, you can't have seventy billion dollars unaccounted for and then run to a mic and say, We need money, we're underfunded. Yeah, exactly. Well in and, anything. And in anything. Just, because that money goes into general revenues like this. And if you don't sound to post, post, post spend it on healthcare, you could be spending it on post secondary education, or you could be spending it on housing, or you could be spending it on addiction, but it seems you're not spending it on that either. Yeah. Premiers. Well and let's not forget the problem. That, the province of Ontario just cut $2.7 billion from education. While and every three feet, there's a new cannabis years. store. And I can, I'm going to be able to buy beer and wine in corner stores in 2026. So yes. Doug wants to keep us drunk, dumb, drunk, and high. Yes. So we don't know when we're being robbed blind. Doug Ford is controlling the things he can, like paying $1 for a paper bag to get out of the LCBO because he has absolutely no solutions and nothing to offer to solve the big problems like healthcare and how we take care of our seniors. As an example, um, the Minister of Immigration of Quebec, Christine Fréchette, basically said, Notre gouvernement travaille déjà pour réduire le nombre de résidents non permanents, notamment en repartissant les demandeurs d'asile qui représentent plus du tiers de cette catégorie en Québec. Basically saying, our government is already working to reduce the number of non-permanent residents, notably by uh, distributing asylum seekers who represent more than a third of this category to places outside Quebec. Uh, with regard to the troisième lien, or the third link, uh, they said that it is going to be reserved for public mass transit only. The project is being studied by La Caisse de dépôt et placement du Québec. Um, they sent in the, their uh, ministre d'Assemblée nationale, Jean, membre de l'Assemblée nationale, I'm sorry, Jean, uh, for Jean Talon, Pascal Paradis, uh, to basically say, uh, en 2026, on va refaire notre plan sur les transports globalement, sur la mobilité durable à Québec, et un troisième lien autoroutier va être exclu de ce plan-là. Basically saying, in 2026, we are going to redo our, uh, uh, we're going to re globally redo our transportation plan uh, pertaining to durable mobility in Quebec City, and a third link autoroutier, so a third link uh, that has anything to do to, to help transport cars is going to be excluded from this plan. Um, so that's, that's yes. So that's what's uh, going on on the Quebec side. Uh, but let's remember as well when it comes to this stuff that uh, when we're talking about uh, the temporary or uh, temporary residents, temporary immigration numbers, we, we've got three types of immigration, right? We have a regular immigration where we're, you know, raising it by a certain amount. That program is working fine. That program, the numbers are adjusted to what it is that we need. Then we have our other things. We have our asylum programs, our refugee programs, and the, the special programs that we put in in case of emergencies. Like, for example, if there's a big flood in Haiti and we give people temporary residence for, for a while, or like what's been happening with Ukraine. So we have those. That's the second pool. And then the third pool are our temporary residents, temporary foreign workers, temporary students, uh, international students. And that's the problem. That's where we have the problem. That's where there's too many people uh, at the moment. But you have to realize that the reason that we have this problem also is the premiers, right? One, on the student side, because they approved so many fly-by-night colleges, they just gave the licenses out like they were candy because they would get these students in and they would charge them more and the federal, the provincial government would get their cut and would fund post-secondary education with that rather than funding it properly from general revenues. They decided not to do that. They had a cash cow outside and decided that they weren't going to do the money. They were going to you know, use them not responsibly budget to ensure that post-secondary education was properly funded regardless of how many international students we have, or regardless of the price of oil, or regardless, you know, of export the export market for what it is we export. Um, so that's that's a provincial government program. And then you have to realize again that we had this huge staffing shortage for a while, and provincial governments actually did things like, for example, loosing rules for foreign students. Foreign students that were only able to work 20 hours a week maximum and work on campus, all of a sudden were allowed to work more than 20 hours a week and were allowed to work off campus, creating situations like the one that my Beaver Sweetie noticed as he's teaching at an accredited uh, college uh, of applied arts and technology that has a long-standing history of performance and achievement in Ontario, and uh, noticing that a lot of his students uh, that came from elsewhere that were here on temporary student uh, uh, visas uh, were not being allowed by their employers to attend class, even for exams or tests. 
The premiers built that system. Yeah. Yes, and they blame they blame the the feds on for for this issue. Yes. Like this. So uh, yes, housing is not meeting, keeping up with, and uh, also, you know, so housing is not keeping up with demand. And right now we have a federal government that's working both on the supply side with the housing accelerator program, because the revamped housing accelerator program, because they had to change the focus of it to go around the cities and deal directly yeah. with the municipalities because the cities were not getting it done. And the, the municipalities, the mayors were begging for the money. Uh, and, uh, on that, there's a lot of people that are upset, like said, the provinces, but it's like, um, provinces, um, you, you're you, the ones who showed the federal government how to move fast and break things and say, uh, yeah, you know, they're the, they're the way that things have been done forever. Yeah. We're just not going to respect that. So, um, don't get mad now that the federal government has learned how you play the game and is playing it according to your rules. And wow. here's the thing, pre premiers, you can pass all the laws you want banning the federal government from dealing directly from municipalities, but if the municipalities want the money and you're not going to give it to them and the federal government is, there's absolutely nothing you can do to stop them because I would love to see the first premier that's going to take the federal government and a mayor to court because they have agreed to yeah. fund housing. Well. That's not going to be a good PR move for the party that takes them to court. Well, and, and let's go, let's go back to this trough. So call check, the bluff. Check this out. This is, this is where I got my, my headline from, if you will. Watch this. It's just, it's there you like go. 27 seconds. And it says 70 billion in health transfer is not being spent on health care by provinces. This is criminal. What, what did provinces do with that 70 billion? Billion. One thing somebody should ask the provinces before they come back for more is what did they do with the money they were given the last time around? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what happened. The, the, since 2000, uh, federal transfers for health care have more than quadrupled. Uh, provincial spending on health care has only tripled, only tripled. Uh, if the provinces were spending all the money that they got from the feds, they'd be spending about $70, $70 billion more than they are. So what did they do with that $70 billion? They did it, well, put it to other purposes. One thing somebody... So, I mean... Like, and this is why the prime minister wanted more rules to transferring money the last time and all the provinces said, no, no, <laughs> no, no, no. no. Because they want the money, they want to take their cut, and then they want to spend it on their pet projects. They are not spending the money on that for which it was attended and that which they agreed to spend it on. Which is criminal. It's criminal. Because, and they can't account for it. Or if they can't account for it, they won't tell us where it is. This should be criminal. It should, it should be, be a criminal, criminal investigation. Every scene, if I was the federal government right now, I would hear this piece of news and I would ask the Auditor General to audit every freaking provinces healthcare. I Where's would spend a whole bunch of money to hire a whole bunch of auditors and I would make it a national thing and I would make sure that that report was out way before the next budget. Yeah. Yeah. The and premiers are the problem. The premiers are robbing us blind. $70 billion. And remember the difference between a billion seconds and a million seconds. A million seconds is what? 12 days. A billion is 32 years. Multiply that by 70. Do the math. Yeah. That is more money than you can truly, actually, possibly comprehend. It's beyond comprehension. $70 billion is missing from healthcare across this country because provincial premiers are robbing us blind. It is, oh. Like, Literally, I, and, they, and they've been doing it for a long time. Been yes. doing it for a long time. We just we just talked a couple of days ago about how Premier Scott Moa in in Saskatchewan actually introduced an industrial carbon tax back in 2019, mm -hmm. and it was bringing in about 25 million dollars or so, you know, like this. And and he was not putting it in the budget as a line item in any way, shape, or form until last year, when he put on electricity costs, subjected put a carbon price on electricity costs as he was telling the people of Saskatchewan, that he was relieving them from paying it, which ballooned that carbon tax from about $25 million to over $330 million, sorry, $25 million to $330 million a year, or maybe even $363 million or something, $323, something like that, million a year. And last year, he finally had to put a line item in his budget because, you know, now we're talking about triple-digit millions, so I guess he couldn't hide that. 
and then he calls it like output based system performance or something. He gives it a name that nobody looking through the document, if you took the time to do your work as an engaged citizen and look through the budget and see whether or not there was a carbon tax, even though there was a line item, finally, after it being hidden for four years, I guess, you would not know what that was. Exactly. They had fun with words. They gave it a fancy name so nobody would notice. And finally, not a while ago, he said, yeah, that's a carbon tax by another name. I and, and, and then, of course, the journalist asked them the, the immediate follow-up question. Well, if you have a carbon tax and it has another name in your privates and you've had it for the last six years and you've been trying to hide it, why are you objecting to the federal carbon tax? Asked no journalist whatsoever. Yeah, there's, there's a conspiracy of silence. Uh, that's how I call it. I mean, look, tell me. Tell me I'm wrong. I would like to <sighs> It's true. Ask the painfully obvious follow up question, please. Especially yeah, if you've done all the work of putting up the setup I, and then don't ask it. There's it makes one wonder more frustrating if, for people at home. If, if a lot of these reporters are so worried about, I'll, I'll find myself Gilmore. That's what I'm calling it. I'll find myself Gilmore because Rachel Gilmore, who was working for Global, called out Polyev. And like less than a week later, she was suddenly unemployed. Mm hmm. Now, I'm not saying it had anything to do with, with what he said, mm -hmm. but I'm saying it did. <laughs> yes. But it's like, imagine being in court. Like, imagine like, you know, you're in court. It's like, is this your license plate? Yes. Are these your fingerprints on the weapon? Yes. Like this. Oh, it seems you cut yourself when you stabbed her. Is this your blood? Yes. Oh, well, I guess the killer has to be the neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, oh, another it's like, news. Okay, like, so and like ask them all that questions. Where were you? Were you there? Were you hovering over the body? Yes. Like this. And the final question, Mr. Johnson, did you kill your wife? It's like, ask the final damn question. You they're did not, the whole they're setup. Not, they're not asking us. <laughs> it's like ugh, super frustrating. Uh, I played a clip for you. I've got uh, it. I, I got a clip. Ready to, this yeah. is Danielle Smith um, oh. showing extreme gall. <sighs> yeah. That's, that's to put it lightly. My message to Ottawa is that federal politicians and the prime minister in particular should do his job and stop trying to do my job. That, that's, that's what the message is. And uh, I don't know if Premier Higgs would, would uh, ha ha said the same thing, but when we meet as premiers, the really interesting thing is it doesn't matter whether it's NDP or liberal or progressive conservative or UCP or Saskatchewan party. We all come from different parties and different perspectives, but we are united in that, that the federal government should stay focused on the things which they need to do. There's lots of things they need to do. They, they need to shore up national defense so that we're not an international embarrassment. They, they need to make sure that our foreign policy is aligned with our allies instead of our enemies. They need to make sure that they're expanding international trade so every single one of our 10 provinces and territories can get our product to market. They need to, they need to build critical infrastructure like the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which is going to be getting to the finish line. That is the kind of things that they should do more of. They should be building ports. They should be building rail lines. They should be building highways, Stephen Guibault. They should be making sure that they are living up to their obligation and their treaties of, with First Nations. They should be f funding health care on reserve, mental health and addiction treatment on reserve, uh, water on reserve, building out economies on reserve. They should make sure that our, the value of our dollar is not diminishing internationally. They should make sure that they can process passports efficiently. They should make sure that, we c that the uh, Pearson Airport is, an ex is a, a lovely experience to go through and that all of our <laughs> airports are operating efficiently. There is no shortage of things the federal, that the prime minister can do. It's not a boring job. <laughs> so when you see in Alberta that we are going to take a posture more like Quebec, which is no thank you, we don't need your policy advice on school lunch programs, on pharmacare, on dental care, uh, that is just just give us the money and trust that we'll be able to deliver on this. That's the approach that we're going to take. Oh, shut up. Be pretty vocal about doing so. And I hope to see some of the other premiers do it. OK, now let's talk a lot about this, first of all. OK. She's basically saying, Prime Minister, let me do my damn job. You're not doing your damn job. Number one. Number two. You're going all, oh, you've been going all over social media and every other media you can find and telling the prime minister that he should fire Stephen Gilbo. If the prime minister dared to tell you who you could have in your cabinet, you would have a fucking shit fit.
Yeah. So you need to shut your pie hole. Shut All your right? dick hole. She talks about defense. They just announced a defense strategy that's going to bring us to 1.76% uh, of GDP and get us out uh, and also get 20% of our defense spending spent on uh, procurement and research and development. She talked about passports. She talked about airports. Those are solved. She talked about ha not having a foreign policy that caters to our enemies, which we do not have, but the Conservative Party of Canada does, however, particularly when it comes to Ukraine. She talks about First Nations. She's the one that's claiming that she has Indigenous ancestry and has been doing things without properly consulting First Nations, whereas the federal government has been a was been on uh, a reconciliation thing. She talks about water on First yep. Nations committees. Uh, communities, the federal government is the government that has done more than any other federal government combined Ever. Ever. to bring drinking water to reserves. Uh, she talks about infrastructure programs that need to be done as she kneecaps the green energy sector in the province. Um, she, like this, and She's talking about a national school food program, which when, when we reported on this, uh, a bunch of kids in her province had to go to the hospital with renal failure because she couldn't make sure that food was properly prepared for the program that they actually do have in daycares, not even schools, daycares. Yeah. She raised electricity 128% over the course of one year, maybe more. That was July that was numbers, year over year inflation. Um, like, just give us the money and we'll spend it the way just we get, see fit. That's what we've been doing. And that's where we and where you are right now is as a result of just giving you the money and trusting you. It hasn't worked. And clearly. How many and, times? Number, and then hold on one more thing. And she's when she's talking about Quebec, well, yeah. Well, when Quebec goes to the federal government and asks for money, like for example, for housing, which mm -hmm. you are going to the you're going to, you're you're trying to pass a law so that the money has to come through you so that you cannot spend it on housing, like you have not been spending it on housing up until now. Yeah. I guess in Quebec, when they say give us the money, the premier of Quebec shows up to the table with a matching $900 million in housing funding and then gets the federal $900 million, and then announces a $1.8 million <laughs> housing plan Billion. in his budget. Yeah. You take the money and do whatever you want with it. Just give us the money. You give it to we'll an oil company. It doiled out to the... It's like, no, no, we've done just give you the money and let's send it. I hope it works out. It didn't. And especially with you, it's definitely not going to, because you first choose to lie about everything. And you know that little, uh, and then the government goes, it's not a boring job taking that little comment again that the prime minister <laughs> said, you know, when he said, say plazo, when he was talking about certain things being tedious. I bet you he had Daniel Smith in mind when he was talking about oh, things, yeah. the parts about the job that are particularly tedious. Because, but she took that, you know, you notice that little smirk on her face, right? And there's everything about her demeanor when she delivers on that type of stuff that just freaking makes my skin crawl. She is haughty. She is arrogant. She is flippant. H A U G H T Y. And she looks to she looks at you right in your face and she does that smile thing that she does. Mhm. Mm like this and smugly tells you this is his how it's going to be and you can tell her to her face. That she is wrong and that she just lied and she just continues like nothing ever was. Do, do you remember nothing the Bill Burr was. skit from a Bill Burr uh, comedy bit from a few years back when he said, I'm watching Oprah one day or The View or one of these programs and all these women on there were saying, there's no reason to ever hit a woman. There's no reason to ever hit a woman. He says, oh, you're wrong. I'll give you a goddamn reason, you, but you don't do it. <laughs> I'm like... Oh, I don't hit people. I don't believe in it. I'm a pacifist. But do you ever want to smack the shit out of somebody more than her? Every damn day. I, like, you want to do it, and I've got a reason to you do don't. it. You don't. You don't do it. Wanting to do it you human, doing it criminal. Exactly. Y you want to do a lot of things, but you don't act on them because you know they're wrong, they're incorrect, they're improper. But God, Because you're damn. a grown-up who has mastery over yourself. That's why yeah. you don't do it. But the feeling of wanting to, oh yeah, totally human. 
And you are totally allowed to feel that emotion because you're human. But you don't act on it. You don't give into your base, your base thoughts, emotions. You, you don't give into it, even though you might want to. Again, like Bill Burr said, I will give you a reason, but you don't do it. Mm -hmm. now I got another clip. And here we go. Oh, this is her. This, and this is this is her being corrected. Yeah. She's talking still, about she's talking about funding for post secondary education grants, that type I, of stuff. I'm glad you said that. Again, sent making really, the claim really that I'll, this. Yeah. Again, making the claim that Alberta is somehow hard done by. Uh, number one, you gotta present projects that are research worthy, and you seem to be completely against science and actually you know, expanded knowledge. Yeah. Uh, so don't be surprised if you, you know, if you you basically throw that can't do attitude and culture into the whole university system and you're not getting proper funding. But hey, let's be honest, right? Alberta has two of the largest universities in Canada and they get a lot of funding because academics like to get published and academics, as opposed to politicians, actually have standards to the research and the products that they put out. And they're peer-reviewed and they're held to account. What, what you see on the screen right now is a comment from Mohan. And I love the way you said this, Mohan. I love the way you wrote this. What she's doing to Canadians living in Alberta is criminal. It is. But I love the way Mohan wrote that. Canadians living in Alberta. Yes. Canadian first. Yes. Canadian first. What she's doing to Canadians living in Alberta is criminal. Mohan, that's a, that's a high five. That's a fist bump. That's a bro hug. Dude, nailed that one. Nailed Elbow. that one. Boo. Yep. All right, let's let's right. watch this. This and this, again, this. her tone, the way she carries herself, everything about this makes my skin crawl. Oh yeah. This is how not to be. And again, you don't hit people, but I can give you a reason to want to hit somebody. And this is a good one. I have been given enough indication that the federal government uses its power through researchers to only fund certain types of opinions, certain types Lie. of researchers. Bullshit. And I don't think that's fair either. I, don't, I think we need to be able to have a balance in our university if we're going to have a robust, free, and democratic discussion about all issues. But the National Research Councils are, are depoliticized, right? It's, it's a jury of academics or peer-reviewed, and they make the decisions through application on, on research grants going to university, and it's all posted publicly mm -hmm. so you can see what's there but you you don't you don't have confidence in that system I, I have heard enough from some of our academics about how difficult it can be to be able to access some of that funding so we just want to do a review and we want to just see if there's some way that we can make sure that we maintain the environment at universities which there should be which is that all people from all political perspectives are able to engage in a robust debate and have a robust research agenda. I, I can I can feel some researchers at the University of Calgary, the University of Alberta, and, and places in, in, in your province getting anxious with that because, you know, the universities have agreements straight with these granting agencies. It's meant to be independent to fund, you know, a, a, a research that is protected by academic independence. I, I mean, well, what look, kind of a role do you see there for you? I, you know, I, I guess if we, if we did truly have balance in universities, then we, we would do. see that we would have just as many conservative commentators and just as we do liberal commentators out of our journalism schools we'd see just as many conservative minded journalists graduate as we mm. do progressive minded uh, journalists graduate we don't see that and so that leaves me to be concerned that we're not fostering the kind of environment that allows for balance because we need to have balance if we're going to have ba a balanced discussion in the broader pub public sphere it begins at the universities and i get that but that would be an issue with campus culture, which is funded by provincial governments. This mm -hmm. is like medical research and scientific research and, 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 and humanities research that is not necessarily determining the makeup and composition of the people who you, work at You know, I guess university. we'll see. That's why we're doing right. the review. We want to see uh, what kind of things are being funded. And if there are any areas that are, are problematic, we'll have to keep that in mind as uh, funding agreements are renewed. Oh my God. She is an awful human being. She's just often, she literally, just, uh, the, it's like, it's like, He's literally saying, you are lying. And she purses her lips, does yeah. that, how gives them that, how dare you sort of look like this, and then smiles. Keeps those smiling, but without the eyes actually thing, that thing that she does. Yeah. I guess. And then she is more condescending uh, to them. Um, ironically enough, she's literally calling for quotas. She's saying that 50% of the projects that get funded 
in order to be able to have a balanced discussion. And she never wants a balanced discussion on anything. She wants to monologue. She doesn't like discussing. She likes monologuing. See, he was trying to propose a discussion. She just talked right past him. Yeah, I understand that you just said a fact, but uh, oh, we'll we'll see. We'll have to take that in consideration like this. If there is anything that's problematic, oh, you know she's going to find something that's problematic. But then, like this, and she's going to use that as a pretext to do whatever she wants. Uh, she's saying like this: if these things were important like this, we would have half half the commentators coming out of uh, graduating that or getting uh, would be getting funding. It's like uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but the overwhelming majority of commentators that actually have a platform in Canada are pro conservative. Yeah, regardless of the university, she doesn't yeah. actually doesn't believe in journalism. So she, I, mean, I don't know why she cares whether or not the journalism school is actually pronounced. But, but it's sort of like this. If we had a fair thing, you would be admitting people to journalism schools and you would be giving your scientific research dollars based on their political. Your first criteria would be making sure that political ideologies get 50% each regardless of the merits of the projects first. Not the most meritorious projects, not the most interesting level of science, not the actual best journalists, regardless, or the best candidates to get in the schools based on their grades, whatnot, like this. But first, ask if they support conservative ideals and make sure fit 50% of the money and the spots go to them. That's literally what she is saying. Did, like this, the parties that keep on talking about merit meritocracy, and, oh my God, we can't have these stupid quotas, is literally calling for quotas and lying. Yeah. That the independent boards of NSERC and the National Social Sciences and Humanities Board, like this, the academics there that look at all the submissions, evaluate them, and decide what gets. That these are actually not academics and professionals in the business reviewing their peers, but actual trust and Trudeau's handpicked people that are deciding, you know what? Oh, well, yeah, this guy, I know he's a conservative, so let's not give him funding. And that is not happening. This is an utter and complete misrepresentation. She literally lied like she breathed. And uh, and smug. Smug. I know you you just told me I'm lied and I don't care. Did you catch the, the, the part of her diatribe where she said, progressives versus conservatives? Did you catch that in her speech? She actually said that. Progressives versus conservatives. I'm like, what what the fuck are you going on about? Oh, I know what it is. She's listening to pastors. She's listening to people like Parker. And Pavlovsky. Exactly. And and, and look, I I got to put this on the screen because this is like right underneath the video because the video was from the breakdown from uh, our buddy Nate. So he tweets this. <clears throat> Despite uh, being corrected that grants are determined by academics, academic panels and not Justin Trudeau, Smith not only doubles down on that, she then says that with the powers of Bill 18, she will block renewals of grants if they don't align with UCB views. Yeah. Let's scroll down to the very first response to this tweet because we just watched that video. And the first response is, that is not what she said. She said if it isn't balanced and representing all perspectives, they would look for a way to make it more fair. Let's just scroll down a little bit further to see Nate's response. She denied the existing process exists and then threatened renewals of grants. She's targeting empirical sciences because she doesn't believe there's enough conservative journalists. There's captions for the video if if that helps. No, she did not deny the existence of a process. she She said... She's had a lot of feedback saying the process isn't working in a balanced way and she will be reviewed to ensure that it is fair. You keep misread. Christy, research grants have nothing to do with undergrad journalism studies. That's it. Yep. I, like, and she, she received feedback much like the provincial print, like Blaine Higgs received, or the education minister in New Brunswick received feedback. Two people. Or Scott Moe received feedback that trans students thing was in it. That whenever that we've received a lot of, no, you no. haven't. You haven't. That's a lie. That's a lie. Stop lying to us. An outright lie. Stop outright lying, lying to us. The academic world is curious. Period. They believe in things like the scientific method. So yeah, odds yeah. are they're probably not going to be conservative. People who are curious and ask questions and actually believes in science and facts and data and empirical proof are probably not going to be on your side. Danny. 
that that's not an academic problem. That's a you problem. <laughs> As in, you're the problem. <laughs> oh my God, that woman. I swear, there is no lie she will not tell. Again, I Nate know. Pike said it best. Once you first accept and surrender to the fact that every time she opens her mouth, she will always first choose to lie, then you can start to begin to understand her. That's who she is. It's literally who she is. She's a liar. And she's worse than Polyev. And here's why I say that. Yes. Somebody said that too. Polyev was the worst. And I say that she's the worst. No, please. She's I'd worse. Love to hear why. And here's why. Because Polyev is always this arrogant, smug prick. This fucking asshole. She does it with a smile. Because she yes. actually has media training. So yes. she's able to come in with a, a nice sort of sweetness and, and, and counter... Nice, your, nasty. Your actual facts with bullshit. And nice, she's nasty. good at it. She's so good at it. In a calm really voice. Is. Oh, it just sounds so reasonable. It makes a smile. Exactly. She's really good at manipulating people. Oh, she's, she's a, really good she's at getting her, her bullshit message across. Yeah. Because and, it's delivered with a smile and some kindness and the soft music and the lighting. And the, she's lying directly to your face and you're believing it because she delivered it in a nice way. Whereas Polyev is a smug asshole. And a lot of people who are conservative are like, that guy's a dick. I'm never voting yep. for them. Yep. She will get the votes because the way she delivers her message. Yep. But what you don't get is that she's fucking lying to you. Yep. I posted the clip and she is somebody reported. She's as creepy as pee, pee And I said, more so in my honest opinion. She's the type of person who would be sitting there smiling at you, claiming that the surgery won't hurt at all prior to them not using anesthesia. And afterwards, she'd pat you on the head telling you you imagined the pain and it was Trudeau's fault that you did. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yes. Have the kidney surgery. It won't hurt at all. Oh, what? Fine. There was no anesthesia. I cut that program. Well, it didn't hurt that much, did it? Look at well, you. You, remember, you survived. Oh, it was really painful. Oh, well, that's Trudeau's fault. I had remember, nothing to do with that, even though I'm the one that told him to cut the anesthetic. Doug Ford was going to cut the uh, the funding, the budget, because he was cutting health care left, right, and center. I think he cut $2 billion out of the last yeah. budget. I don't know what the current and budget is. You're talking about anesthesia for colon colonoscopies now, right? Yes. Yeah. He was going to, okay, you're going for colonoscopy. There's no anesthesia. What? We're going to shove this giant tube up your butthole. Hey, Doug Ford, scream to me that you've never had a colonoscopy without screaming to me you never had a colonoscopy. Look, once Because if you had, colon, you wouldn't even have thought of that. Here, Here's the thing. There's no nerve endings in the colon, so they can see a polyp and and pull it out and you don't feel a damn thing but the entrance you feel and and maybe you're into butt sex maybe you're not i don't know but here's the thing it's not a pleasant thing it's not done for pleasure it is done for exploratory to make sure you don't have cancer so if you do not anesthetize someone before you give them a colonoscopy that's really gonna hurt it's right. really gonna hurt and he right? tried to he tried to cut that from the budget, and somebody thankfully somebody went through that budget with a fine tooth comb and said, uh, "Excuse me, Doug, if that's going to happen, you're the first candidate." And then you tell me how quickly we reinstitute anesthesia for colonoscopies. And they brought it back real fast, real fast. Because who yep. wants to get a giant camera shoved up their butthole? Nobody. Nobody wants, well, there's, I shouldn't say nobody. There's probably a few people that do. Everybody has their own kink. But I'm going to say the vast majority of people, even if you like the butt sex, even if you like to put stuff up your butt, that's not th th the scenario where you want something up your butt. It's not. Because you're in a hospital bed. You're in a gown, you're exposed, you're vulnerable, and this is not a romantic setting. <laughs> it's not something that people, in, well, um, again, the vast majority of people enjoy. There are, I'm sure, I, there's absolutely somebody somewhere who does. And I'm not kink shaming, Linda. I'm not. I'm not Jim. I'm not kink shaming. I'm, I'm literally not. I would say that most people in a hospital setting don't like to have anybody stick anything up their butt. Period. Who likes to be in the hospital? Most people don't. Most people don't. Who likes to be examined while in the hospital? Most people don't. You don't want to be in the hospital. So let's take away the, the, the one thing that will make the, 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 the exam 
a little less harmful and a little less pleasant. We're going to take that away from you. Well, guess what? Guess what? People called it out and called out Doug and said, nah, <laughs> Doug, you're the first candidate. You're going for colonoscopy first, Doug. You're first. <laughs> it's just, just, just <laughs> first. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, Saucy. I came back at the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, enough with her. Yes. Because she's got enough airtime time already. Um, over the course of the weekend, uh, unfortunately, we do have to go into this. I am so sorry that we have to do, uh, but we had been talking about it a lot, and uh, the situation keeps on uh, escalating uh, or, or changing rapidly. Uh, but it's everything that has to do with uh, Israel and uh, Palestine at the moment. Uh, last we uh, looked, um, the... I don't even know. I don't even know how to qualify where it is that we left off. Uh, but basically, uh, Israel decided that fighting a war on one front wasn't enough. Uh, that on April first, it uh, launched a strike on an Iranian embassy uh, mm -hmm. in uh, Damascus, or well, a uh, consulate in Damascus. In the process, by the way, damaging the Canadian embassy. Mm -hmm. something about which Pierre Podievez had absolutely nothing to say. Funny. Funny how that is. Eh? Yeah, just, um, uh, just putting it out there. But for those just, who do not know, the Canadian embassy was damaged in the blast because ours is close to the Iranian consulate in Damascus. Uh, now, uh, I don't think that we've had anybody working at the embassy for a while uh, as a result know. of what's going on in Syria, uh, but it is still Canadian territory and it is still our property. Um so, yes, uh, you can uh, bet that the Prime Minister had a couple of conversations, um, either directly with Netanyahu or uh, through Biden, uh, to let him know that he was, certainly was probably not pleased about that. Um, and as a result, well, um, in international foreign affairs, when somebody uh, attacks your soil, you have to respond in some way, mm -hmm. uh, because you can't just let it sit there and, you know, say, you know, we're not going to do anything. Now, uh, Iran did respond, and often these responses are choreography. Oh, yeah, yeah very much so. so that yeah. you know. Uh, a lot of people go, Jesus, this sounds like it's staged and whatnot. Yeah, There's it's staged and discussed. Uh, Iran basically called, well, not called the United States directly, but through back channels and yes. partners and other stuff, let the United States know 72 hours before they actually did it. The hit took place. Yes. And Iran told so told partner countries, proxies, all like this. It is not targeting U.S. personnel. It is not targeting U.S. bases. Yes. We are going to hit here. We are going to hit at this time. Like this. Yeah. And it will be nothing more than that. Rest assured, we are not targeting U.S. personnel and bases. And remember, the United States, when the embassy was hit, was the first to come communicate with Iran and say, hey, guys, this is really, really, really not us. <laughs> yeah. So this has been going away. This is a two-way street of communication that's been going, back-channel communication that's been going. Uh, now the United States' response to Iran telling them a 72-hour notice that they were going to hit something was pretty much, uh, okay, don't use this as a pretext to hit us. No, but um, this is like, no, you will not hit an mm -hmm. Israeli target anywhere. It was like, yeah, fine, just don't use this as a pretext to hit us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's a switch <laughs> from the U.S. position. Uh, United States, France, and the U.K. Uh, did help to intercept greater than 300 drones cruise and ballistic, ballistic missiles that were launched by Iran. Uh, most of them were intercepted. Um, you know, it was probably in single digits the number of them that actually did land somewhere along the way. The damage was limited, but an Air Force base in the south of Israel took a hit uh, to their air defense systems, according to Iran. Iran decided that that was enough. They would claim victory and uh, basically said that, uh, yep, that's all we intend to do, and we consider the matter settled. 
So again, staged. You hit us, we have to hit you. Here's what we're going to hit. Here's the time where we're going to hit. We're not going to do anything else. And once we've hit, we're going to consider that we've responded and there should be no further escalation unless you want one. Mm -hmm. So yes, choreography, all of it. Um, the Ron Foreign Minister, after the hits, stated, as you know, last night, the forces of the Islamic Republic of Iran struck the Zionist regime's military targets. Our actions were limited. We had informed the White House that our military actions were to be limited, precise, with the intention for self-defense and to punish the Israeli regime. In these actions, our forces with precision used both drones and missiles to target a military site in Israel, which houses F-35 jets. They have used this site to attack our consulate in Damascus, and it was the site, the site which we struck. There was jubilation in the streets of Tehran. Uh, Israel announced the reopening of its airspace following its repost. Uh, so, yeah, 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 following Iran's repost, sorry, not its repost. Um, so, uh, clearly, uh, Israel feels that there's not much more that's going to come if they reopen their airspace that uh, quickly, but there's a fear of a widespread regional escalation because Israel decided that, hey, you know what, it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. to throw bombs across the border in Lebanon and fight with Hezbollah and fighting with Pal and fighting with Hamas as well. Let's open a front. <laughs> let's, let's open a front with Iran as well. Because the United States learned that fighting a war on more than one front when it decided to go into Iraq as well as Afghanistan after 9-11 was a really good move. I mean, mm. all along the United States has been telling Israel, do not make the same mistakes we make in Israel. It keeps on going, you know what? You fought a war on two fronts. We're going to fight one on three. Yeah, Aren't we good? Fucking overachievers. Uh, if the U.S. responds with an, uh, Iran also said, if U.S. responds with an escalation, Iran, gen, uh, this is Iranian General Mohammad Bagari, said, we see this operation as completed and successful. It's over from our perspective. If the Zionist regime takes any action against our Islamic Republic of Iran, either on the soil of Iran or the centers belonging to us in Syria or elsewhere, our next operation will be much bigger than this. If the U.S. gets involved, none of its bases in the region will be safe. Um, Israel has not admitted that they struck the consulate in Damascus, but flippantly says, well, that wasn't a diplomatic building. It was a military facility. Sure it was. Sure it was. Uh, War Cabinet member Benny Gantz, and I have to issue a self-correction here because uh, I stated a few times on past shows that Benny Gantz is probably more to the right than Netanyahu. Uh, that's probably incorrect. I was thinking of Yoav Gallant, his Minister of Defense, uh, not okay. Benny Gantz, which I believe was his ma uh, one of his main rivals uh, for the pre for the uh, the prime ministership uh, when he was running uh, in elections. Um, but he's part of the war cabinet. And he has, says that Israel will exact a price from Iran, quote, in the face of Iran's threat, we will build a regional coalition and exact the price from Iran in a way and a time that suits us. And most importantly, in the face of our enemy's desire to harm us, we will unite and become stronger. Now, whenever a country says that we will respond in a way and a time that suits us, that is code for usually there will probably be no response. Because we're going to keep on saying, putting out the threat that at some time, you don't know where, you don't know when, but we will get you back for this. Mm -hmm. As opposed to saying, you hit us, oh, <laughs> set your watch, motherfuckers, it's coming. Uh, right? This is like, <laughs> at a time in the, in the passion of our choosing, somewhere down the road, we will respond. Uh, that's usually what you do when you want to let the people of the country know it's like, yes, we're still fighting this, uh, but you're trying to send the message to the other country. Okay. Enough. Mm. Usually. 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 So that's usually. So, uh, so when I say this is choreography, right, the Iranians knew by launching drones and missiles, they would not be able to do much damage. So this is literally more symbolic, right? Well, this is Bo, according to Bo of the fifth column here. The Iranians needed to do something. They couldn't just decline combat. So the question is, how do you retaliate and not escalate? And I think the way to do that is that they, through various back channels, through the Arab states, even direct back channels with the U.S., they basically telegraphed and signaled, quote, this is what our plan is. This is what we're going to do. And as long as Israel does not do a counterstrike, we're not interested in an escalation. Now, that's sort of the intent. The problem is that once you pull the trigger, you know, you can't control where these things go. Yeah. And that's a quote, sorry, not from Boba the Fifth Column, but Cameron Bukhari, who's the senior director of the New Lines Institute in Washington. 
Now, the reason why this strike from Iran is notable is because normally when Iran strikes, they strike from their proxy locations so that they can give themselves the fig leaf of deniability. Right. It's like, we all know you did it, but you can't prove it. It came from proxy. It might have been a bomb gone awry or whatnot. It's like, but they still have the fig leaf of deniability. Of course they do. Yes. Uh, Iran didn't care about that. This is the first time ever in the history of Iran-Israel skirmishes where Iran launched an attack from directly within its borders. Mm. This is This is new territory. This is new territory. Iran didn't even attempt to create the fig leaf of deniability for itself. It's like, no. yeah, we did it. Yeah, yeah, totally. And we di- we didn't even. And you know what? We did it from our, we didn't bother to place a phone call to another country. Whatever progress they did, we did it ourselves. Yeah, we're fully admitting it. We're not. We're not hiding. We're not shying. We're. We did it. Yeah, it was us. Yeah. Uh, the UN Security Council held an emergency meeting. Um, the prime minister responded, uh, you know, these attacks demonstrate yet again the Iranian regime's disregard for peace and stability in the region. We support Israel's right to defend itself and its people. Uh, in addition uh, to the usual suspects, na- nations like uh, the Netherlands, Denmark, Saudi Arabia, Oman, and China, oddly enough, are among the China. countries that called for restraint. The UN Secretary uh, Don't you mean General, Beijing? Don't you mean Beijing? Oh, well, yes, yes. Beijing called from restraint. China's fine with it, though. Uh, whoa. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres sa- stated that neither the region nor the world could afford another war. Quote, now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. Now is the time for maximum restraint. Um, after uh, you know meeting with G7 counterparts, Biden reaffirmed Americans' iron- ironclad commitment to Israel's security having uh, after having met the national security advisors as well. But twist, urged caution on Netanyahu by mm. essentially saying Washington will help Israel defend itself, but will not take part in any retaliatory operations against Iran. Oh my God, it's almost like Israel's making it so that Iran and the United States might actually have a pathway to becoming, if not friends, at least civil to each other. Well, that would be cool. That mm. would be cool, because uh, the United States certainly wants that. Um, Biden also to Netanyahu basically said, um, take the win. Take it. Yeah. Basically, go out and say, "Hey, uh, did you see our air defense? See what your effort was like? Yeah, don't do that again. We, <laughs> we will thank you hard." Yes. Now, apparently, it seems that the response as to what's going to come next is not going to be made by Netanyahu himself. I don't know if this is something that the U.S. negotiated, but it will be handed off to not one but two other people who must agree. So maybe that will calm some passions a little bit. Hopefully. Yes. Iran warns that any American threat that harms its interests will be met with a reciprocal response, of course, lots of sable ratting, blah, 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 blah. But uh, this thing by the United by Israel, this move seems to be a silly move. It has to be a silly move because it kind of drives the United States right back into sorry, a silly move by Iran, sorry, because it kind of drives the United States back in Israel's arms in a way, even though uh, the United States is making the comment, you know, like this, we will not participate in a retaliatory effort. If Biden's back to saying stuff like this, we have an ironclad support for Israel, like right, this, which yeah, he yeah. was not saying publicly a few days ago. Um, so, I'm not sure uh, how this exactly advantages Iran, but then again, they had to respond. So, it's like, it's one of those weird situations. It's like, you know, you're going to clearly create the opportunity for the United States to stand more with Israel by doing that. But when somebody attacks you on your soil, you have to respond in some way or else you're just saying, Hey, come on, rolling out the red carpet, call me and attack us whenever you want. We won't respond. We're patsies. So, um, and, and, and yeah. it's never been up for debate that Israel has a right to defend itself. That's never been a question. It's never been up for debate. They, period, have the right to defend themselves. That's that's not a question. And this was measured. This was, uh, I would say, a, a level-headed response. What's happening yep. in, in Gaza? Not. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and ironically, uh, this move could actually end up freeing money for Ukraine in the United States because last February in the United States, the Senate had passed a $95 billion foreign aid package that provided military support for Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan, but it's been held up by the 
anti-everything, mm. no, 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 no caucus right, yeah, in yeah. the House. Uh, now Mitch McConnell, who's the Senate, uh, the minority Senate leader, uh, and who has announced that he will not be seeking that position again. I think he's realizing it's time for him to go. Yeah, is now saying Congress must discharge our fundamental duties without delay. Interesting, um, though, right? A yes. bit of a bit of a change, yes. like. But now you've got a whole bunch of Republicans that are in full in in the camp for Israel, and it's like um, there is a Senate bill that's passed. So all you have to do is pass this to the House. Yes, that means that money will have to go to Ukraine. Yep. Uh, but if you want the money for Israel. You take the good, you take the bad, you take them both, and there you have the facts, facts alive. <laughs> what show was I watching recently where um, uh, Mindy Mindy Cohn was appeared in this program I was watching? Oh, it's it's Royal Palms on Apple oh, Plus with Carol Burnett, the new show with Carol Burnett. Yes, yes, and and Mindy Mindy Cohn. I love was her. it Con C O H N? I believe not yes, Cohen, but Con, uh, who used to play uh, uh, Natalie. Natalie. Natalie on the facts of life is on this program. And, uh, I mean, I she's, love her. she's my age, but she's aged really well. Like, Oh yeah. The, you see her right away and like, Oh my God, it's Tootie's best friend, Natalie. Yeah. Remember Tootie? <laughs> yeah. No, no, Come on, uh, we all watch the facts of life. If you're of a certain age, you know exactly very, what very, I'm talking about. Very elegant. And you know who wrote the theme song for that program and who said facts it? of life. Yeah. So it was sung by Gloria Loring, and it was written, uh, produced uh, by uh, the late. Um, oh, shit. I see his face. I can't think of his name right now. His son is a very famous singer. I can't think of his name right now either. Uh, no. Canadian. Uh, Alan. No, Alex. No. Uh, shoot. Come on. Folks, remind me. He was the father on Growing Pains. Alan Thick. Thank you. Alan Thick wrote that song. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, he wrote a ton of uh, he wrote a ton of jingles songs. Yes. and songs. Alan Thick. Thank you, Michael. Yes, yes. Alan Thick. I, I was blanking there for. I, I was like Alex Alan because he took over. For, so most Canadians, if you are of a certain age, you will remember the Alan Hamill show. The Alan Hamill show, Alan Hamill was married to Suzanne Summers. Alan Hamill had a talk show yes. on television, which was taken over by Alan Thicke. And it was called the Alan Thicke show for a number of years. And then he had a nighttime talk show called Thick of the Night, which didn't last long, which was truly yes. sad because it was a good show. It was a good show. It just didn't get an audience and they didn't give it enough time to get its legs. Yeah. And then, of course, he went on to fame and fortune with the Alan, uh, the father in Growing Pains. But yeah, Alan Thick was a prolific songwriter and producer. Yeah, he wrote he wrote the themes to Different Strokes, The Facts of Life, The Wizard of Odds, The Joker's yeah. Wild, which was a game show, Celebrity Sweepstakes, The Diamond Head Game, Animal Crackups, Blank Check, Woo, Wheel of Fortune. Yeah, yeah. and well, Wheel of Fortune. Was, still, yeah, yeah. Just, no, he he was making <laughs> look. Alan Thick could have stopped working decades ago and just sat there and said, "Yeah, no problem. I'll just I'll just hang out here." <laughs> yeah. And there you go, man. Mr. Grizzly, I have a picture up here of uh, Mindy Khan, what she kind of looks like now. And, uh, very elegant. There we go. Yeah. I mean, she, like, looks, oh. she looks like she's living her best life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's like, oh, there's yeah. Natalie. Yeah. 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 I was a big Natalie fan, I have to say. <laughs> I was a like Joe said, fan. Anytime. Yeah. Well, Joe's great. But anytime she's had an, uh, a series or something, uh, you know, since the facts of life, I've always t t tuned in. Uh, oh, yeah. she's actually a very good actress and actually relatively underrated. I'm surprised that she hasn't had, uh, many more opportunities actually. Do we, do uh, we say that, actress? that, that, that we might say be actress today? Actor, I, I just actor. say I'm actor. Sure. Yeah. I, I just say actor. So I don't offend too many people. I try not to offend anybody. I mean, really, <laughs> try but yeah, yeah, no, no, she's amazing. Oh, God, I didn't, I, I was, I, I was interested in watching uh, that series and now that uh, has uh, made me uh, even more so. Oh, it's, it's Although good. Although I really it's, it's don't really watch good. much TV at all anymore, which is kind of I don't of watch good. television. I watch streaming services. 
that not even streaming though. I really just don't like unless it's unless it's like live tennis, live curling or something like that. I'm almost not watching so, TV. So here's how these I days. the only time I see advertisements these days. Well, Prime, they have ads at the beginning now. They started selling ad space. But if I'm watching, um, like after the, the Grey Cup, I will pay attention to the NFL because during the regular NFL season, I don't give a damn. I really don't. I'm a yeah. CFL guy, okay? But after the Grey Cup, I'll start watching the NFL. And that's when I realize on Sunday evenings when the games are on, the, the late night game, it's like every second ad is either a, a drug ad or a fast food ad. It's one or the other, <laughs> literally. Yeah. And I'm like, is this, is this what? Is this what regular television looks like these days? The only time I see ads is Sunday nights when I watch NFL football because I don't watch broadcast television. I just don't. I don't. I'll, I'll go to I'll go to different news services to watch their streams online, uh, either on my phone or on my TV or on my computer or my mm-hmm. laptop. But I just I don't watch broadcast anymore. I really don't because look they. They, they slit their own throats, which is a terrible statement, I guess. But they really did when it came to, to local news and, and, and production for local news. They've, they've cut the budget so much so that people just stop tuning in. And I'm one of them. Maybe if you put some money into the budget, I would watch local broadcasts. But since you've cut it to the bone, I just don't care anymore. Yeah. I don't. Um, one last uh, little thing to close off on the Iran thing that you may have uh, noticed um, is if you're on social media, is uh, this thing going on. There is a picture you see of uh, the Prime Minister, Christopher Freeland, and Sean Fraser at an event, yes. and they are holding cameras up. Now, of course, because uh, the loud mouths and the negative people have to fill um, every moment with twerking and twisting and lying and hate and character assassination. Uh, you get some people going, well, at least our federal government remains focused on Canada's real challenges and not absorbed with narcissistic selfies. Uh, if you will put the picture up, Mr. I'm Grizzly. Working on it, uh, just give me a second. Here. To see. Uh, which, of course, you're right. Uh, the trope again of the prime minister being self-absorbed and, you know, loving to get his picture taken and, you know, the whole thing. And, um, well, it seems that uh, this actually wasn't selfies. It seems that all three of them were at an event at a time that there was a vote in parliament. Mm -hmm. And them all holding the cameras up at the same time in the same way is not three individual members of a party all together deciding at the exact same moment that they have synchronized narcissism. This is uh, facial recognition. Yes. Before they can so vote, they, this is how they have to sign in. Yes. This is what and they're doing. Yes. Yes, exactly. It's facial recognition. Uh, and then people are going to turn around and says, oh, well, gee, facial recognition, blah, blah, blah. I guess, uh, yeah. They should have been doing their work rather than hobnobbing or schmoozing or all that type of stuff. And it's like, um, they're clearly at work because like there's people behind they're working. There seems to seem, seems, seems to be a banner and all that kind of stuff. So we literally had, yes, exactly. Stompy T.O. police horse. We are sick and tired of explaining how to use a smartphone to you, Dave. Have some pudding. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Um, so, uh, again, let us remind you, uh, all people, uh, you know, saying like this, or oh, we're schmoozing, whatnot, that the leader of the opposition has literally used facial recognition for voting uh-huh. at least twice that we know of. One on the day of his all vote, uh, all night votathon that he decided to get out of by staging a fundraiser for himself and then realizing he needed cover. So he went to a Hanukkah lighting ceremony where he exploited the Jewish community to create, say, Hey, I wasn't going to a fundraiser. I was going to Hanukkah lighting ceremony. And there just happened to be this fundraiser going on that, you know, was just instantly organized after I decided to call the vote-a-thon day, not before. Oh no, no, no. There's no way I chose the vote day to coincide with the fundraiser. That was already pre-planned. So I personally didn't have to stay in the house and do my own dirty work. Yeah. And then I used the Jewish community and I used them as human shield. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. So I go to their event to say, hey, no, no, I had a legitimate reason not to be there. And while I'm there, at some point, I hold the camera up to my face and I vote against funding for a Holocaust museum in a Jewish community center in Vancouver. Because, Or more recently, when he staged a no-confidence vote on carbon stuff, that he himself mm-hmm. called for and also was not in the house Skipped to vote out. because yeah. once again, he decided to go to a fundraiser. Yeah. So when we're talking about people, GG, you know, using remote voting so that you can schmooze and hop. And I'm like, let's uh, look at the leader of the opposition because that we know of on the record, he's done it twice to be able to go to a fundraiser and get a photo <laughs> up on a Hanukkah lighting ceremony that he prevented every other member of parliament from going to. Yeah. I force them to stay in the house. And here you have a picture of three cabinet ministers, yeah. including the prime minister, together in one room, together with other people there. Hold on for you. And you think that this is a this is a hobnobbing, schmoozing event rather than do- them doing their work? They've literally found a way to be virtually in two places at once, which means they're more effective and you're bitching that they're not working. Yeah. 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 Stretch Armstrong couldn't, uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't span that gap. Yeah. I have a Captain Obvious moment for you here. Here's a Captain Obvious moment. Um, This is uh, from the CBC, posted uh, at 4 a.m. today, so five hours ago. The dirty secret of the housing crisis? Homeowners like high prices. Yes. That's a Captain Obvious moment for you. Yes. (laughs) We would have told you about the finger. (laughs) I mean... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You mean I can earn a lot more money if I sell my house at a higher price? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's such a Captain Obvious moment. I'm yep. under, under, under surprised face. See, not this one. <laughs> yeah. God, just what? I don't even. I. I don't have the words. I, I don't know. have the words. I know it's so damn. Sweet. Stupid. <laughs> it, really, it really, it really is. It really it is. Really, truly is. Uh, tomorrow, Kits and Cubs is budget day in Canada. A couple of uh, little tidbits coming up to it. Uh, Robert saint Aslan, who's a senior vice president of policy at the Business Council of Canada and a former advisor to Bill Morneau when he was finance minister, uh, states that the government is going to have to make some fiscal room to uh, make uh, to cover the 38 billion dollars in pre-budget announcements of the past weeks which means according to him it must either delay spending on other projects or increase revenues by raising taxes my guess is that increased revenues by raising taxes is going to be the option um Aslan says that the government is squeezed by the choices that it's made and he's thinking that the new tax would quote either be either a surtax on big corporations or a wealth tax. He says that those sound very good and they would be popular, but he says they are terrible in practice. Now, I'm not sure if uh, that opinion is tainted by the fact that he was an advisor to Bill Morneau, who also has like, you know, tons of money uh, and uh, certainly probably would not be too keen on a wealth tax. But uh, we'll... Uh, put that aside. Uh, Christian Freeland, who's the Minister of Finance, uh, pledged that the deficit will not get bigger no matter what, um, in the budget at least. And um, for that to happen, uh, one has to assume, uh, make the assumption that inflation will remain relatively steady mm. and uh, a government does not want to look like it is adding to inflation in case the numbers creep up a bit. Uh, because, you know, if there's a, like in the United States, if there's like a 4% bump in inflation one month uh, as a blip, as things are correcting, moving around, you know that Pierre Poliev is going to be all over that and say, see, 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 it was that, mon- that money announced in the budget that caused that, even though not a cent of it has been spent yet. Um, and it wouldn't be for a while, but he would blame it on that. Just like, you know, when the unemployment rate goes up 1%, you know, uh, or like, well, inflation did go up 0.1% uh, a couple of months ago. Then Pierre Polyev had all his memes going, see, oh my God, they're spending us. And, and then when it went down the following month, he was nowhere to be seen. Uh, so you don't want to create an opportunity for PP to, to pounce like that. Um, but I think that the government of Canada, and here's might be the strategy, actually, kits and cubs, so uh, you heard it here first, uh, might be counting on a few interest rate cuts coming uh, mid-year when it's doing its budget. And that would create additional fiscal room by lowering debt service payments. Because mm. when the interest rate goes up for us, it goes up for the federal government as well. Now, of course, they have a better rate than we do. Um, but if uh, the 
Bank of Canada starts changing its uh, its prime lending rate downwards, that is going to have an impact on the amount of money at the end of the year that will have gone to debt servicing. So there might be a potential windfall there. So when you have a combination of savings based on interest rate cuts, a capped deficit, and perhaps finding a way to come in under budget next year, when you add those three pools of money, all of a sudden, in the budget that is going to be tabled in the year going to an election, you can create an image of really good stewardship by saying, hey, we projected that the deficit last year or this year would be, but look at us. It's like $6 billion less because interest rates went down and we didn't fill up the spending <laughs> with other things. But shh. So... It'll be a little bit of a sleight of hand should that happen next year. It's not because that the federal government would have done something spe specifically spectacular when it comes to managing the finances to have come out under budget by six to $12 billion. It would probably be just a reduction in project amounts set aside to service the debt if there's interest rates lower. Yes. And like I said, if you can couple that with coming in under budget, And you don't make higher deficits. All of a sudden, you got a pretty little number at the end of the year. Um, and again, don't blame uh, the feds uh, for doing it. Again, the premiers showed them how. <laughs> when it comes to this, oh, you gave me all this money for healthcare. Whoops! Only two of the four billion got spent. Oh, look at this! At the end of the year, we came in under budget. Hmm. Well, look at this. We have a pool of money of $13 billion all of a sudden to build a highway that we never planned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, you're going to have uh, the usual. They're spending us into the poorhouse response. Uh, that's going to happen. Uh, now, of course, um, interesting uh, things that will happen is that well, along with the budget tomorrow, uh, the latest inflation numbers for Canada will also be coming out uh earlier in the day. So, uh, you know, if there's an uptick like there is in the United States, like this, the second those numbers come up, if there's an out, uh, there, there's an uptick count on conservatives claiming that the $38 billion already announced definitely is the cause of this inflation. Oh, of course, of course. Yeah. yeah. Like this. And their narrative is going to be that the government is spending into the poorhouse. We are going, you know, ass over tea kettle uh, we have the most incompetent manager he doesn't believe blah, monetary blah, policy blah blah. blah 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 of course monetary policy is the bank of canada's job so the federal government shouldn't have anything to say about it do uh, whatsoever or, or actually think about other than you know like this when's the when's the when's the next change in monetary policy from the bank coming and how do we respond other than that there really is nothing to think of uh, mm. much like when the prime minister says, says said that housing is primarily a um provincial responsibility yeah. and then they lost all their minds for him telling the truth because other than housing on indigenous reserves and housing for uh, veterans uh, in the military and uh, maybe not even veterans actually i mean like in terms of veteran hospitals but not uh, veteran housing when they they've left but housing for the military and indigenous housing the federal government's not responsible for housing whatsoever whatsoever they used to fund affordable housing projects but that uh, stopped that started to be cut back in the days of Mulroney and then Chrissy Martin did nothing and then Harper finished off those programs completely. So we have a 30-year deficit, at least in housing, that has come along. Easily. And then they turn around, they say the federal government did nothing, but they announced in 2015 that there were going to be two programs that got off the ground in 2017. They made adjustments to them based on what industry demanded at the time. And now that the premier's screwed up on temporary immigration with foreign students and foreign workers. Suddenly we have an issue that the federal government is responding to and they're dealing with it on the supply side by having revamped the housing accelerator fund, which is now slated to create at least 1 million housing units, 600,000 apartments, the rest in actual individual housing units uh, over the next 10 years with, I think, 175,000 of them expected to be built before we go into an election. Um, so they're actually doing it. They're working on the supply and on the demand side by curbing the temporary immigration uh, numbers. So they are doing what needs to be done, but uh, as we mentioned, uh, it is going to take a lot of time in order to get things back in balance. 
Uh, and it seems that they want to go even faster and further because despite everything that they have announced, and a lot of this is targeted to uh, the youth demographic, which they seem to be losing. Um, but yes, uh, Sean Fraser had basically said, we can dramatically scale the pace of home building in this country. And uh, it seems that they will be uh, more measures in the budget than that what we already know announced on that. And Christian Freeland, with regard to fiscal responsibility, has said, we remain absolutely committed to being there for hardworking middle-class Canadians, and we will not raise taxes on them. Right. So, uh, so which kind of hints that the fact that there will be, you know, raising of taxes, probably just not on anybody that makes under 200000 or possibly even under $400,000 a year, in this case. Um, so that's uh, some budget stuff. The other part is that uh, artists are also making specific demands of the budget. They're looking for uh, help from the government to ensure a more equitable distribution of revenues from streaming services and more support for concert venues. Uh, $30 million, $32 million had been announced recently. Uh, the president and uh, the director general of the Association Canadienne de la Musique sur scène, her name is Erin Benjamin, request uh, made a $50 million uh, requested that the $50 million promised in the last election to finance uh, Le Fonds du Musique du Canada uh, would be forthcoming and that there would be $10 million to support live, the live performance sector, uh, independent music halls specifically. Um, musician Florence K. Uh, in Quebec, who is very, very popular, is quoted as saying, C'est pas beaucoup ce qui est promis si on considère que les plateformes d'écoute en continu, de streaming, font des sommes phénoménales sur le dos de ceux qui créent le contenu. Basically means, uh, it's not, what that which is promised is not really much when you consider that uh, streaming platforms make phenomenal profits off the backs of those who create the content. So they're hoping for a, a little uh, help. Uh, from the federal government to try to balance that out and making sure that uh, there's places to actually perform that are well-funded and can keep op maintain operation. Uh, the final thing that I have for you today, uh, before I ask if you've got something before we go, Mr. Grizzly, is that um, today, Kits and Cubs, is a very, 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 very special day. And um, I'm looking for my tickle trunk right now. And I can't I seem know. to find it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Oh, darn. Uh, uh, oh, well. Well, imagine me with my uh, Christmas bonnet on. Okay. Get some cubs. Uh, for some reason, I cannot seem to find it. And I usually have it nearby for occasions just like this. But today is the day, finally, that jury selection starts for one of four of, thankfully, former President of the United States, Donald Trump's criminal trials. Criminal Not trial. the civil the criminal. Today is jury selection day. For the first time, a sitting or former U.S. president has ever been on trial yeah, this for is, this is a crime. Historic. Yes. Uh, now, in this case in particular, uh, it is very, very important to note that um, it's the least um, grievous of the four crimes he's uh, committed, alleged to have committed, sorry, we still have to say allegedly. Yes. Uh, and uh, this is the case that seems to be, um, how would you put it? Uh, people are calling it the least spectacular because it's the Stormy Daniel case and everybody keeps on referring it to the hush money case. But it is not a hush money case. It is a falsifying documents case. And as the judge stated, recently, explicitly, it is also an election interference case. It is a 2016 election interference case because the allegation is that he falsified those documents and made those payments so that the news would not get out soon after the uh, Access Hollywood scandal where, you know, the clip of him on the bus talking about uh, grabbing women by, uh, women by the Kit Kat. Yeah. Uh, was something that you just did, you just did, and they would just let you do it if you're famous. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's what's uh, going on to, over there. So it's uh, it's not just hush money. And uh, Trump's uh, uh, you know statement is like, oh my god, uh, you know, it's like I was just trying to save myself embarrassment from my family, and it's like, uh, no, mm. no, 
if you wanted to save yourself embarrassment from your family, you would have kept it in your pants. <laughs> so, and uh, I also will note the irony of uh, alpha males, all, self-declared alpha males all over the internet uh, cheering for a guy who had to pay for it. But anyway, uh, <laughs> just saying, the irony well, is that there. Uh, now, this it comes after many last-minute attempts from uh, by Trump to try and delay the trial. He tried to sue the judge specifically. Uh, he tried to get a changed venue, saying that he couldn't get a fair trial in New York because there are just too many Democrats in the states, and you should probably move it to a place where there are more Republicans, so I'd have a better chance. Uh, tried to uh, have immunity. Tried, and it, he he tried every thing in the book. And his last three um, attempts to delay it were all dealt with like within minutes, like same day presented in the court. Okay. Yeah. I've heard your arguments for the last hour. I, I'm going to decide now. No. Mm -hmm. uh, so, <laughs> so he, and this, because this is a criminal trial and not a civil trial, he literally has to be there. He has yeah, to be there be and sit the there happens. for the whole damn thing like this. And because in a criminal trial, you're not allowed to speak out of turn. Mm -hmm. You can only speak when spoken to. Ooh, the judge is going to have a fun time with this one, uh, trying to get him to keep shut up because you. Well, he'll be he's held in contempt. In he'll, yes. he'll be held in contempt in the first thirty minutes. Watch and see. Yes. he won't shut his pie hole. No, I can't believe they're saying this about me. And he's already around. He's already out there milking it. Of course unquote. he is. On Monday in New York City, I will be forced to sit fully gagged. I'm not allowed to talk. Can you believe it? They want to take away my constitutional right to talk. I have a crooked judge. Uh, no, it's court of trial. You talk when you're given permission to talk, and you don't talk. So you're not. In a civil case, he claimed the same thing that he was gagged because uh, he wanted to make a closing statement. And there are rules to how you can make a closing statement in a court case. Like, for example, you have to stick to the evidence that has been brought and you're not allowed to bring you arguments of evidence. Nope. And he wasn't respecting that. And the judge shut him down and he said, Oh my God, I've been persecuted. No, you were given the chance to speak. You, you, you at closing arguments, which is normally not done, and you were said, "Here are the here's the here's the sandbox in which you can play." And you said, "I don't want to play in the sandbox. I want to play outside the sandbox." And the judge said, "Okay, well, you made that choice. Screw you. You don't get to talk anymore." So, <laughs> uh, so play by uh, the yeah. rules or get booted. It's not yeah. Play by the rules or get booted. I mean, it's really not that complicated. Um, he is uh, also. Um, had a, a gag order put on him because uh, he uh, basically uh, went out and made comments about the judge's daughter, said that she you know, we used to work for a Democrat organization, so therefore the judge is tainted and blah, blah, blah. And that's one of the reasons he had to be rescued, recused. And uh, after he did that, he was told not to. And then he talked about her again. So the judge came up and put an expanded uh, gag order. So now he's basically, he basically can only talk about the judge and yeah. the DA. And nobody else, no court staff, none of their families, no nothing like this. And he's taking that fact. He's taking the fact that he's been gagged there and he's conflating that and telling his people, I'm going to be gagged in court. I will not be able to say a word in my defense whatsoever. No, you will be able to, you just won't be able to, sp to speak whenever you damn well want. Be great. You'll have to yeah, exercise some impulse control. I would love him to be gagged. You'll have to take your riddle in that day, Don, not sniff it. Not Seriously. All right, I got a couple of quick bites for you here. This one is interesting. This is from uh, Cheryl in Nova Scotia at mini underscore bubbly. Uh, company launches alcohol vending machines in Dartmouth. Yeah. Well, I'm giving uh, our, our little Lola here wants some blackberries. <laughs> she likes blackberries. Yeah, oh. alcohol vending machines. Um, notice the brands that are represented on that machine. They're all part of the same company. Blue Bud Bud Michelob Ultra. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's all like Labatt products. So that I find interesting. Well, that's like uh, the soft drink dispensers, right? Either yeah, all Coke yeah. products or Pepsi yeah. products. So, but, but hey, look, it's a company that launched this, a private company in, in Dartmouth that came up with it. So if they if they secured a deal with them, whatever. Right? What do I care, right? Yep. A lot of people are questioning. I go, well, that's, uh, you know, is there? you've got to be kidding me. Um, no checking identification anymore. Cannot see any problem with this. It's like, actually, the article states that the machines would need your government ID, and it would also scan your face to see if it matched your ID. My issue is giving a third party your government info 
these machines could theoretically be hacked. Well, they are on a network, probably a closed network, but still, how comfortable are you with that? Because I'm, mm. I'm a little, you know, uh, uh. Mm. Mm. Oh, and I have to show mm. you a photo here of what's currently uh, going on in downtown Ottawa. There's a protest taking place. And I guess these folks thought it would be appropriate to... Um, now, technically speaking, this is no longer a private company. It's owned by a large corporation. But still, the people who work there are private citizens just trying to earn a living. And these folks thought that blocking the entrance to a coffee shop in downtown Ottawa would be a good way to protest, which I think is ridiculous, but that's just me. Yeah. Anyway. Don't get, in the, don't get between people and their coffee. That's usually yeah, not an advisable Not a good idea. Yeah. To start yeah. with, I, I, I just say, <laughs> say, I don't touch the stuff and I know better to get between a person and their coffee. It's dangerous, right? Like, uh, that's it how you is get smacked. very dangerous. That's how you oh, get hurt. Word. And I have one video clip and then we really got to go because I have okay. a, a meeting in like five minutes. But this, this video clip is 58 seconds. I think you'll find it interesting. Somebody, I, I think it was Tabby G who did this to me. I'm not sure. I, I can't remember. So whoever sent it to me, uh, thank you. I apologize if I got your name wrong. But this is a very interesting video and I think you'll be amused at it as I was. Okay. Interesting fact, you may or may not know this, but when we were in the womb, before six weeks, all of us had female genitalia. Did you right. know that? All fetal genitalia is female genitalia up to six to eight weeks. That be, so, so dudes, I know you've all noticed that you have this weird seam on your scrotum that goes all the way from the back to the very front. You know why you have that? Because your pussy that you used to have fused itself together to make a nutsack for balls that you didn't even have yet. So think it through. If you believe that life begins at conception, then you also believe that every man is a trans man. So I thought that was pretty funny myself. Yep. <laughs> that's uh, the comedy church for those uh, people who are uh, listening at home yes. and uh, would like to uh, hear more of that. But yeah, it is uh, indeed true. 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 Yeah, no, it's absolutely true. I've known this for decades myself because, you know, I'm smart enough to be able to read and understand what Because chromosomes? Is. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, um, technically, every man is a trans man. Yay, science. You know, if you believe that an embryo or an egg is, is you know, like if you're the state of Alabama... That's life. That means, did I? How many chickens did I murder in the last week? Mm. Uh, you know, I, I'm, a, mm. I'm a serial murderer because I mm. ate eggs, chickens. Bum, eggs. Bum, bum, bum. You heard it here first. Oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, one, uh, yep. Tiny bit of, nope. You know what? We'll That's, do that. We got we to gotta wrap. That's it. Really, Cubs. That's going. the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember that sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. Um, let's see, because democracy is something that you do, do write those letters. I'm doing things in the wrong order, but that's how they came to me today. Um, if you would like to make sure that you do not miss an episode, you do not have to, thanks to the Ray Girl, because she sponsored our pod page. If you scan the QR code, that will soon appear. Or if you're listening to podpage.com. Okay, I don't see it on my screen at all. Podpage.com. Uh, slash the true north eager beaver lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words there it is uh, that will take you uh, to our pod page site and if you uh, subscribe there when we have something fresh off the bandwidth it will come directly to you also if you would like to support us please make like kit elaine and go to the true north eager beaver media incorporated youtube page and there we have three buttons for you like share and subscribe lick them click them tick them it makes us so very happy when you do and i am very distracted by this bundle of cuteness <laughs> uh because i just want to pet myself oh, uh, oh, her, oh, i just want to pet her so much look at that heart <laughs> nose she has a heart nose eh do you see uh, that 
Her nose is a big heart. Oh, she's man. nothing but love. This little she's girl, such a cutie. My uh, eighty-pound the... muscle-bound love hound. Yes, the world needs more Lola. You are right, Kit Michael. Uh, the crotch cam. Thank goodness for Lola. Says <laughs> Kit <laughs> Jim. Kit Mister Jim. Um, so yes, and uh, please go to our YouTube page uh, and. Uh, click our buttons there uh we are at uh, 742 the last i checked so 750 is three quarters away to the thousand which is uh, the goal that uh, makes it such that our youtube uh, page will start uh, being able to monetize certain things for us so all the help you can do in getting us there we very much appreciate and if you would like to support us in another way please go to the emergency Beaver Lodge Hydration Fund at our coffee page. And if you scan the QR code by Mr. Grizzly's head, it will bring you right there. Coffee, K-O hyphen F-I dot com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. Please, 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 if you can make a donation there, we really, really would appreciate it. Thank you very much. It helps us uh, keep the show going. And Kit Sassi says, look into channel memberships too. Uh, that's yes. a possibility, but it would have to be a possibility, again, only after a 1,000, if only to be able to oh, give people the option membership. to watch a show without, yes. uh, w- without commercials. That's right. Um, yeah. Because right now we have nothing additional to offer you for the money. We, we uh, which is why there. we're still doing tips. Yeah, eventually, we'll eventually, we might have subscriptions and stuff like that. But uh, yes, we'll absolutely. Um, we, we we don't want to rip you off. No, basically, of we don't want to make you pay for getting nothing different than you're already getting. Right, and mm-hmm. you're supporting us uh, generously with tips uh, already. So you know, um, yeah. You know, it's it's true that subscriptions make uh, for a more stable revenue stream and that type of stuff because there are months we do uh, really well on tips and then we go uh, for periods of like, you know, three, three, four weeks where we get nothing and that's fine like this. And then we go for a period of like two, three weeks where they come in like gangbusters. So, you know, uh, Kit Linda, you give us a free show five days a week. That's not nothing. It, it No, it, it definitely is not nothing. Uh, but, you know, you have to build up an audience and then once you build up an audience and once you know you have the means to create some bonus content or at least I'm have really a, right enough of viewership that some people will actually want to buy ads and you can make ad free shows and that type of stuff so you know th- there's a value proposition in in there but i'm i'm very grateful that kits uh, are offering to pay for the product without anything more than it is uh, now uh, it, it, it warms my heart. I gotta go. <laughs> really I'm, I'm already late for a right. meeting. I gotta go. Okay. Um, so, kids, that's it. Have a great day. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Roll the credits. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph something for our opening and closing sequence music.